from Toronto to Tokyo, and from Thonia to Syrinx, this is The Basement, your companion to the Ready Player One novel. Join our hosts each episode for complete chapter breakdowns and deep dives into the pop culture references through a series of challenges and homework assignments. The Basement is the Ready Player One podcast for people who love things. And now, please welcome Albert and the rest of the Gunchers for this week's episode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the third episode of The Basement. Uh, I'm calling this We Die, and there's a reason for that. We'll talk about that because, a little bit later. Because the podcast is seven hours long? Yeah. Is that, okay. It's seven hours long. If no. we're lucky, we'll get no. out of this in seven hours. I'm only kidding. I'm such a jerk, but go ahead. So there's our, uh, so joining me tonight, we've got a, some some new guests and uh, an old grumpy one here. So I'll <laughs> first start off with uh, Mr. Mike. Mike, how you doing? Get off my lawn. Uh, I'm good. A little grumpy and tired, but I'm I'm good. This will be fun, though. Yeah, we're 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 getting Mike through a, a list of uh, different steps for rehab to uh, since the Last Jedi, and this is is one of them. So <laughs> we're hoping that we'll put a smile on his face. So in addition to Mike, um, we've got a a, a new uh, Gunter with us tonight. Um, you may know him from the Cantina Cast. He's been on there more most recently with Mike and I. Uh, he's now a permanent host, uh, co-host of the show. Um, that's Mr. Coco Puffs himself, uh, Jonesy. Say hello, hey, Jonesy. It's Coco Pebbles, my friend. But I'm super excited to be here. Oh, man. it was Pebbles. Oh. Well, Fruity Pebbles is still the best cereal of all time. So I don't even know well, why. Two weeks their own, Mike. I don't debate. judge. No, no, well, I judge, and Fruity Pebbles <laughs> pretty, is the best. Pretty harshly, I can't believe I <laughs> agree. See, with Mike. yes, but the Last Jedi is awful. We can continue now. I got yep. it out of my system now. We're good. All right. So we've got uh, three old guys, and we thought to provide a really cool dynamic, we would bring on a, a younger gentleman. So let me introduce you all to Millennial Joe. Joe, say hello to the fine folks. How's everybody doing tonight? We're good. I'm good. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty no. excited about this because we got a lot of stuff in here that I, I like this dynamic, honestly. And I, I was being serious there because, you know, I, Jonesy, Mike, and myself, we're all about the same age. And then we've got Joe in here, the young whippersnapper. And I just want to, I'm curious as to what kind of perspective he has, because I gave him all these homework assignments to go watch all this old crap and stuff that I really enjoyed. And I'm like, I don't know if this guy's going to like this stuff or not, but he may, he may, he's kind of an old soul. So I guess we'll have to see on that. So uh, let's get into this, because I'm afraid this is going to be about a four hour show. So I did want to start off with a couple things uh, news wise, and we won't spend too much time here, but um, just as a quick update. So we're recording this on Friday the 13th, if that scares you. And as at least going into this weekend, uh, Ready Player One, the movie, has earned about $400 million, and it is projected to hit $500 million worldwide. So it in most of the stuff that I've seen, if it breaks, if it hits the $500 million mark, it will uh, break even and maybe even make a little bit more than that. And then, of course, they're going to make everything on top of all that once the uh, home releases and digital uh, gets released. So... Um, that's all good news. Uh, uh, gentlemen, I think all of us have seen the movie yet. Jonesy and Joe, how many guys, have you guys just seen it once or? Yeah, just the one time. Yeah, just the once. Just the once. Okay. Mike, did you ever go back for a second showing? I did not because I got involved with other stuff, but I unfortunately didn't get to do that. But I definitely, I might try to squeeze in one more before it, you know, leaves the theater. Although I feel like it's going to leave the theater like next week for some reason or whatever. But, uh, I'll definitely be buying the, the DVD though. And well, actually, digital because I go digital. I don't really physically buy the the, the uh, Blu-ray or whatever. But uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I like. Jonesy, it, you but, gonna you gonna pick up the home release? As yeah, well? I'm excited to look through the home release just so I can freeze each frame and see whatever <laughs> all the things I couldn't see in the theater is just coming at me, you know, at an insane pace. Yeah, that's true. They've um, I've seen some screenshots just recently, screen caps that people have done some 4K screen caps. I don't know where they're getting the footage from. I may but, I may um, have shouted with, out Battle Toads in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> the Clash of the Titans shield. We talked a little bit of Clash of Titans on the last episode, but I I, knew, I caught that one twice in the movie, and I was pretty stoked about it. Um, Joe, anything that stood out from you from the movie in terms of uh, pop culture reference or just something that flashed on that you got pretty excited about seeing? I was really surprised how much uh, Overwatch and Blizzard stuff they packed into it. Um, yeah, that's true. I wasn't expecting near that much. Uh, I do really want to get the uh, home release and just go through some of those battle scenes and stuff. There's so much on screen at once. It's hard to see what's what's going on. I'd love to pause 
about every frame in that movie and see what's in the background. Yeah, I'm with you there. I I have a feeling when that gets released on home release, I will take that two hour, two and a half hour movie and turn it about eight just from, you know, freeze frame in it and going through it. That, that'll that drive my family nuts. But um, all right. So that's all good news for Ready Player One. Again, it continues to do really well um, despite all its differences from the novel. It's continued to do really well. So hats I, off to Zach I, Penn and those guys. I just got a quick question for everybody because yeah. I don't think we really said it officially or even in Discord because we didn't get into it too much, I don't think. But did you like the movie, Albert? Um, oh, yeah. No, I, I love the movie for a lot of different reasons, to be honest. Um, I had kind of I had kind of made my peace with the fact that even even before the movie was out, like well before we had any clues about it. And I think we, you and I were at least were talking about this. I had in my mind that I kind of figured they weren't going to be able to do, um, you know, the gates and, yeah, a, and lot of, yeah. a lot of the stuff. Because because in a book, in the book, and, and I don't want to get on a soapbox here, but in the book, that stuff really... You can pull that off, right? Yeah, um, I does agree. it translate so well into a movie? No, probably, probably not. not, right? Because yeah. all you're doing is now watching. You, you've got an Inception thing. You're watching a movie within a movie, and yeah, I don't know if that's really you know intriguing um, cinema for for the mass audiences. So I totally get the approach. I'm super happy with the race at the beginning. Um, just visually, that was absolutely just crazy adrenaline, and it reminded me a lot of um, some of the Spielberg chases. Um, from some of the movies that he's done in the past and um, the shining uh, is a great, is an, an amazing movie. It's one of my favorite like horror movies. Although it's not too scary, but I thought, you know, you could tell that Spielberg um, and I forget the, um, I think it was a set designer. They were super huge fans of Stanley Kubrick's the, the shining. And they meticulously went through every single one of those frames and were geeking out. I mean, there's some stuff that you can go see online where they've got footage of those two guys just geeking out, recreating these scenes almost to the nth degree. Uh, because for them, that was their, you know, ready player one, so to speak. They were super excited about doing it. So I think all that really paid off in the end. Um, but yeah, I was pretty happy with the movie um, beginning to end. For And again, I liked it for a lot of different reasons than I liked the book. And I think we all talked about it. I think everyone here was okay with it, pretty happy with the, the movie. Is that true? Yeah, I, I was. Um, actually, you know, it's funny because I'm thinking of it Going in, I don't mean to go on long, but this will be a 10 hour show anyway, um, is, is the fact that, um, you know, the, like The Walking Dead, I've been watching it for eight seasons now, and I don't know why I've invested that much into it. But a lot of the fans, the earlier fans were complaining that it wasn't like the comics and then they got their wish. It's like the comics and now everyone can't stand it. So I'm, it's just funny how it is with Ready Player One going into it. We, we were saying, no, we don't, it, some of this isn't going to translate very well. Now, granted, a comic book and a, and a TV show are two different things from a movie and a book, and I get that, but it's the point of, like, you know, you, you want something, and then it goes on screen, and you're like, it's not exactly what you thought it would be, mm -hmm. whereas this, and, and plus, it would be predictable, right? So it's better off kind of just changing it, but keeping the theme of, of the the book, I guess, is what you were, we, we kind of agreed on. But anyway, I won't take up any more time. I just was curious how... People felt about it. That's all. Yeah. Jonesy and Joe, thumbs up for you guys. Two thumbs up. Cisco and Ebert style, or did you guys have some uh, variant opinion? There? I had, I gave it one thumbs up. I, the only problem, I didn't, I'm going to call it a problem. The, the whole thing felt really rushed to me. Like this would have worked a lot better as a multi part, and maybe even just a part one and a part two. I, I was really fresh coming off the books. And so the differences were pretty jarring for me. But like the race I thought was great and, and how they did some of the other things I thought were good. The problem I had was, especially with like H and and the relationship with Artemis and 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 Parzival, was it was just it felt really really rushed, and so it didn't have that time to really grow and and connect. And and the book did a really great job of that. Of course, you had a lot of time in the book to do that. So yeah. that was the only miss I, I really had. Visually, it was stunning. It was an, it was a fun story, but it was just light on the relationship part for me. Everything just felt a little convenient in order to just keep pushing through the story because it had a lot to get through. Yeah. And that's fair criticism and that you're not the only one. I think that was a, a very common theme and thread that I saw in some of the reviews um, for people that said they, they enjoyed the movie and you know, the fair criticisms was, was just that it did feel like it was kind of crammed into, even though the movie was two and a half hours, you know, there was talks of this, this could have been, you know, two movies, three movies. It could have been an HBO series or a Netflix series or something to really, kind of uh, allow that a lot of that development that you spoke of um and you joe how did you, how did you walk away having read the book 
that's pretty much exactly where I fell on it. I felt I really thought this would have been a lot better as a Netflix series, like a one season Netflix series or something like that. It definitely mm-hmm. felt rushed. I didn't mind the changes to the gates and whatnot, uh, even though I just read the book again. Um, the differences were jarring, but I, I think the the changes that bothered me were the out of the Oasis changes, some of the relationship changes between the high five, how when they meet and the relationships they have almost immediately upon meeting it. Um, yeah. And I also, um, the part where Wade would have gone undercover I I like oh, right. I like that yeah in. I like that part of the book quite a bit. It's like some good planning and kind of stealthy, and the changes they made to that I didn't care for. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Again, I think it's all fair criticism. Criticism. Um, so I guess uh, in light of all that, we have um, we they did green light. I guess the at least pre production stuff on. Um, uh, well, I shouldn't say pre production. Ernie Klein has committed that he's starting to at least start the the first steps in getting a second novel out. So a sequel to Ready Player One. Um, that's going to be interesting because we're going to, you know, now is it going to be, are they, is he going to write a sequel to the movie? Is he writing a sequel to the book and let the movie be its I own thing doing, kind of thing? I think he's doing both. I think he's writing the book as we speak, to be honest. Yeah. I, yeah. I could be, I could be wrong, but. No, no, and, he is. I just wasn't sure, like, if the, when the movie comes out. You know, how much do oh, they incorporate to, from the yeah. book or is it just strictly, you know, in its own universe, in the movie universe, so to speak, right? Yeah, I think that's kind of how I think he's going about it. As long as the spirit of it is intact, yeah. I think that's what matters. But anyway. Yeah. All right. So let's move on um, to just the second bit of news. Actually, there were three things. I moved it to the bottom. And so spoiler alert, that's coming a little bit later. But uh, so I don't know if you guys have read Armada, um, but I'm that in the is middle of it. In the middle of it. Okay. Yeah. How about the other two, uh, Joe? You read it? Have you read it yet? I read it right after the after I read Ready Player One the first time. Actually, yeah, no, not Jonesy. yet. Um, I was trying to figure out which one I had to read first, Armada or Artemis. So I don't I don't know the orders of these things quite yet. I'm I'm very new to this whole uh, to this whole franchise. Yeah. So um, so Armada is the the follow up movie to or sorry the follow up novel that Klein put out. Um, and it's based on the Last Starfighter, which which we're going to talk about in in probably great detail here soon. But um, run, coming off the success of the Ready Player One movie, um, I think it was Universal has tagged uh, Dan Mazu as the person that's going to write the um, screenplay. So. That's all set to go. Uh, we don't really have a whole lot of details just yet, but it looks like that's going to be a go, and we'll get to see that on the big screen sometime. So I'm pretty excited about that. I would say uh, Ready Player One is, by far is a, a much better novel um, than Armada, but Armada is so much fun, and it's really just – it almost feels like it just kind of picks up in terms of how you know the writing and uh, pop culture references and all that, that you get all the same stuff in Armada. So, um, Mike, I know you, you said you're about halfway through it. How are you enjoying it so far? I like it, and there are, there are good parts of it, and then it kind of gets bogged down a little bit. But it is, it's. I think it's more fast paced. Actually, I think it kind of, it's like a run and gun type thing. It kind of just gets you right into it, which I liked because with Ready Player One, you had to develop all of that stuff. With this, it was just kind of like, boom, here you go, we're off and running. At least that's how I felt with it. And uh, I'm just curious. The one thing I'm curious when they go to do this movie, and I said, I think I said this on the last episode, is all the Star Wars references that are in Armada. There's more in Armada, I believe, than there is in Ready Player One. So I'm curious how they'll do that on the big screen again. I guess they'll they'll obviously work something out where they get the rights or whatever and enable the show or make the references and stuff, which I hope they do in the movie. So it'll be interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Actually, I'm looking forward to finishing the book. I just haven't had a chance to finish it. But uh, pretty good. But Ready Player One's by far the better book, I think. Yeah, I would agree. Um, all right, so let's do this. So before we get into the main show, um, I kind of made this uh, a segment. Um, well, I shouldn't say it's a, it's probably going to be a reoccurring segment as we bring on new guests. But I wanted just to for for Jonesy and Joe, um, just to take a moment to kind of talk about how they came into the novel, um, how they enjoyed it, how many times did they read it, what were some of their, you know I think they've already kind of mentioned some things, but um some of the takeaways at least from having read it and what really kind of hooked you and i joe i'd probably just like to start with you um when did you first read the book and how did you get it was it just kind of walking by or did somebody hand you it and say here read this sucker 
So actually, for me, I had been listening to a lot of audiobooks, um, and I had gotten on kind of a long John Scalzi kick, and uh, Audible recommended it as a book for me. And I read the description, and I was like, that sounds pretty cool. Uh, and this was only maybe two years ago. And nice. um, Okay, so you had the whole Will Wheaton in, in your ear the entire time. Yeah, that was my first exposure to it. And uh, I loved it, like, right away. I was hooked almost immediately on it. And I've listened to it a couple of times and read it once now. And Yeah. So having um, – so I, get, I, I kind of mentioned earlier, were there references that kind of, like, you know, when you read it, were, were you – keeping up with them or were things are things being said that you would have to kind of come back and go, I'm not, you know, I don't remember that. Or let me, let me research that kind of thing. I would say probably 85 to 95% of the references in it. I was at least familiar enough to understand when I read it. Uh, there were a couple that were hazy. I mean, a lot of the stuff referenced in this book is before my time. Um, but <laughs> like almost Get off my lawn, almost all of it. <laughs> there we go. I mean, yeah. looking at the list of what we're talking about, there is one thing that is younger than me. So, <laughs> uh, one thing. I scroll down now. Oh no, we'll we'll come back to that. <laughs> yeah, we'll come back to it. Um, yeah. But I mean, I grew up with Nick at Night, and my parents, my mom especially, played some games when I was younger, NES and stuff. And I had I had exposure. And as I've gotten older, I've uh, I've kind of taken an interest in some of that stuff and we'll, we'll talk about how I've taken an interest in some of that stuff when we get into the games. Um, but so I, I had a pretty good feeling for most of it. There were some stuff I didn't yeah. understand in depth. Uh, they didn't like have like a nostalgic kick for me cause I didn't have firsthand experience with, but I got all of it. Well, good thing you had the homework assignments and now you're a better person having watched family ties. So uh, we have to talk about that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. All right, I, Jonesy, how about you? When did you uh, pick up the book and how did you get in, into I'm this stuff? I'm really new to it. Um, you guys were talking about it in Discord and the, the, the movie had started coming more and more into the spotlight. And, uh, and of course, I caught wind of this podcast starting to spin up a little bit. And I was like, what are these guys talking about that's got them so excited? And so uh, I did the audio book and this was only about, what was it, maybe six weeks ago? Uh, at most and kind of blitz through the book in about a week uh, through the audio book. So yeah, Will Wheaton is the only exposure I've had to it at an increased speed. <laughs> so, but <laughs> yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. It was, it was an interesting novel just because there were so many of these references and uh, Joe is probably better than me because some of them I had not thought of in so long that it, it almost went over my head and I had to rewind a couple of times just to see if I caught it. And every once in a while, you know, they were so jam packed in there um, that they were just flying over my head. And, and where I really struggled uh, to keep up was more in the Atari. I didn't have an Atari. And so we'll talk a little about this, too. I didn't have an Atari. And so a lot of those games and the things I was really thankful that that Klein uh, described them as well as he did so that I could get on the same page. I can follow the the, the ideas behind them, especially in the RPG worlds and things like that, because I did a lot of that when I got much older, but yeah, it, 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 it was really cool. I, I liked all the references throughout the book and um, it was a lot of fun all the way through. What, what was interesting, it, it felt a little more like a young adult novel to me, except for some of the language that, that popped up from time to time, just in the style. So it was very easy to snap to, right. And, and very easy just to yeah. get engaged with the story. And I, I thought the pacing was was one of the things I really enjoyed the most was it was always just felt like it was moving forward, even in these developmental or flashback type of scenes, I always felt like it was moving forward, which I, which I always like in a book. Right. Yeah, I know it's uh it's got good momentum. I yeah, think, that's a good way um, it. you know, one chapter to the next. So, okay, well, cool. Thank you guys for, for, uh, for sharing that. Um, I one thought last you were thing. ending the show right there. I was like, what? Oh, we're done. Yep. Oh, good night, yeah. everybody. <laughs> um, so one last thing before we get into, uh, chapter one, I did want to give a shout out to two of the folks who, uh, were kind enough to provide iTunes reviews, uh, and glowing reviews. So thank you so much, uh, so for the first one is, uh, Pringrom Jr. And the guy from 88, if I said either one of those wrong, I'm pretty sure I'm, I got the second one, right? Uh, but thank you guys for leaving those reviews. And just a reminder, if you enjoying the show, 
Um, please leave a review. If you don't like the show, don't leave a review. No, I'm kidding. You can leave a review too, but I'd appreciate the good feedback. So thank you guys for doing that. Um, it, it means a whole lot. It's very humbling. So um, again, thank you. All right. So let's get into chapter one. Um, so now, so first off, chapter one is is one of the longest longer chapters in the book, and it it's probably you know one of the darker, morose kind of sorted chapters that it, it just gives us a lot of background into what life is like in twenty forty five, and I, this is all purposeful. I mean, I, I think Klein is really trying to set the stage up front and get it out of the way uh, because this is what you know the the payloads later on and in, in a lot of the the oasis and why these people are are just you know so obsessed with escapism and all of that. Uh, but chapter one opens up with Wade, you know, being woken up to the sound of gunshots, which he, which he says is uncommon or is, is common in the stacks, uh, which is a little disturbing and startling. And instead of going back to sleep, what does he do? He decides that he's going to fire up his old arcade emulator. Uh, he pulls out his his old laptop and starts to play, you know, a, a few of the quote coin op classics. He mentions Galaga, Defender, Asteroids. And then later on, he mentions specifically playing Robotron 2084. And to quote the book, he says, to me, they were hollowed, hollowed artifacts, pillars of the Pantheon. When I played the classics, I did so with a determined sort of reverence, which, you know, the word reverence itself kind of stood out for me because that, you know, it's, you know, reverence is what you would have at a funeral or you would have it, you know, when the Pledge of Allegiance is being said. So you can already tell he's really, you know, invested um, in the, the pop culture, in the nostalgia and what these what these games really did for the Oasis, you know, ultimately at the very end. Um, and this takes us right into the first pop culture references. So Galaga, Defender, Asteroids, and Robotron 2084, um, you know, which by the way, we always called it Robotron. It wasn't until like decades later that I even noticed that 2084 was even on the cabinets. Uh, maybe I was the only one. I don't know. Did you guys ever call it? Would you ever call it Robotron or Robotron 2084? I just called it Robotron, and I remember not liking the game at all. Just walked by it. I never really played it. I just was like, "Yeah, it doesn't appeal to me." But, but yeah, I always called it Robotron. I never twenty eighty four. I just it's new to me. But yeah. Yeah. same thing. Did you guys play this game growing up, or have you got? Well, I think I I asked you all to play it, but um, I guess Jonesy, how about you? No, I'd never played this game as a kid. I, when I looked at the screenshots, because I couldn't even think about it or think about what it was. And when I looked online to see if I could find it on an emulator, um, I still couldn't find it, but I at least looked at screenshots and some videos. I was like, yeah, I do recognize the game. And yeah, it was chaotic. So I, was, <laughs> I quickly went to somewhere else. Yeah. Joe, do you remember this game in the arcades? <laughs> <laughs> did they have arcades when um, he was a kid? <laughs> we d- we yeah, they did. did. We did have an arcade for a short while when I was a kid. Uh, all of the games were much newer than these. <laughs> <laughs> was, the, was the arcade Mazio's <laughs> Pizza yeah. or something like that? No, it was called Tons of Fun, actually. Oh, yeah. Oh. That's the stuff right oh. there. Tons of Fun. <laughs> yeah. that, that could be somewhere in Vegas, too. It was in the yeah. back of the mall across from the Hallmark store. Nice. Mm. The, um, yeah, and, and honestly, there's and just before we kind of jump into the games themselves, there's one more passage in here um, that really resonated with me, and that's where Wade says, you know, playing old video games – Never failed to clear my mind and set me at ease. It was f- if I was feeling depressed or frustrated about my lot in life, all I had to do was tap the player one button and my worries would instantly slip away as my mind focused itself on the relentless pixelated onslaught on the screen in front of me. And that resonated with me just because as a kid growing up, you know, I, I think I mentioned this in, in the last show or the first one, but, you know, I didn't get it. I didn't have a an Atari 2600 until later on in um a few years after it had been released. And for me, even though I didn't have headphones, this was my escapism. I could sit down and play, you know, anything on the Atari 2600 or whatever, whatever video game system. And this is probably true with a number of kids today. I didn't have to worry about, you know, I wasn't thinking about schoolwork. I wasn't thinking about my, you know, siblings or adolescents, puberty relationships, mom and dad. I mean, it's like when you play that and you were you were just in it. You were kind of it was your escapism. It was a way to get away from everything until they told you to get off because you'd been on for four hours. But that's this, just me. This was like um, my twenties <laughs> for Galaga in particular, and like <laughs> two weeks ago for Galaga. <laughs> we've we've got a multi cade arcade machine at my office, and it it has Galaga on there. And like any chance I get, I go because that's like one of my favorite all time games. And so I go down there any chance I get. So no, I. 
I'm right with you, man. I, it really resonated with me. He's like, you know what? After work, I'd go to the bar and I'd play, uh, they had a Galaga slash Ms. Pac-Man. Like I think it was the eighties classics or whatever. Yeah. yeah the the game. And so, and I would just pump quarter after quarter after quarter, pint after pint after pint, <laughs> you know, at, at the bar. And, and it just, man, it took me away. It was, mm, yeah, I, I really, it really spoke to me in that moment. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about Galaga. So Galaga was released in 1981. Um, it was, it was released by Namco in Japan, um, midway here in North America. And it is a sequel to Galaxy in which, man, when, I don't know if you guys ever played Galaxy, but that was one of those games that was kind of like, a, all right, this just, this really feels like Space Invaders again. And um, again, I don't want to knock Space Invaders because I got my butt chewed out last time, but it was a, it was a sequel to Galaxy. And in, in, in a lot of different ways, it was, you know, a, a much better game. Uh, it did spawn a number of sequels. There was uh, Gapless in 1984, which was Galaga, basically part three. Um, part four was Galaga 88. That came out in 87. You do the math there. Part five was Galaga Legions in 2008. And then we had part six, which was Galaga Wars in 2016. I can only say that I played up to Galaga 88 and the rest of them I've never even touched. Galaga also appears in chapter 11 um, when Wade becomes David Lightman from War Games and you know, he mentions that he's playing it. It's it's kind of wedged between, or I think he's playing, yeah, he's playing the game at the very beginning of the movie. But I guess, the, so let me start with Mike. Mike, was this one of the games that you played growing up? And how much, where would you rank this? You know, if you had to rank all your favorite games, where does this kind of sit with you? Uh, I did play it, but I, I, I it, it would be pretty high for arcade games. Like, not like, you know, I'm not considering uh, like the NES stuff, but although this is, a little bit before the, all that stuff, but uh, it was a good game. I liked playing it because it was like Space Invaders to me, and that was one of my. I think that's my favorite Atari game. If I had to, if you put a gun to my head, I would say yes, Atari. Uh, I, w I would go with uh, with Space Invaders, and this is very similar. And uh, I, I I always enjoyed it. I haven't played it in a thousand years, and I meant to download it out of my uh, on my ROMs there, but I never got a chance to do that. So uh, shame on me. I'm a horrible. Horrible student in your class here, Albert. But uh, I do remember enjoying it, and it was fun to play. But that's that's all I remember about it, to be honest. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, Joe, how about you? Did you get a chance to to play this, or was this something that you were already very familiar with? So they didn't have this in the arcade when I was a kid, but my pediatric <laughs> dentist had a Galaga oh. cocktail table uh, cabinet at the uh, in a waiting room, and I played a bunch of it there. When I was younger, nice. Uh, I did play any cocktails at the uh, pediatric. No, no. <laughs> unfortunately, oh, <okay>. no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I did play all four of the games we're talking about today. Um, but I played them a little bit different. I uh, I downloaded them all into New Retro Arcade Neon and played them all in virtual reality. To uh, oh, nice. I wanted to get. A How was that? That was pretty cool. See, I got the uh, the Vive set up, and I was holding a little virtual joystick and doing what I could. Very cool. That, so that would trip you, me out. I think I'm too old for that. <laughs> I can't. Uh, I can't. Eighties music that. in the background and little fake cigarettes with smoke in the background and the cigarette candy. Well, he that was vending machine. It does all that? Yeah. Oh yeah. It's got so all he was of it. really reliving Ready Player One. Yeah, you walk. Was, you're walking around in an eighties arcade, couches around and the whole thing, and you just walk up to the cabinet you want to play. Start playing, put coins in it. That's wild. <laughs> that is cool. Oh. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so did you like the game? I love Galaga. Uh, I don't, it's not a game I go back to hardly ever, but I think just fondness from playing it when I was younger. Yeah. All right. So let's go to our resident expert on Galaga. <laughs> Jonesy, how about you? What's, um, where do you, where do you rank this thing? I know you got, you pump a lot of time into this game just because it's, I think you mentioned it's, at your work and it's available. Is that on free play too? Or are you pumping? No, it's free. Thing? And there's like a hundred games on there. So there's actually, I think four versions of Galaga, including Galaxian. And, but I, mm. I've played them. None of them are quite the same, especially the sequels. They were kind of rehashes. And so I, I always go straight back to just, you know, primary Galaga. Um, it's right up there, man. The, some of my favorite games growing up in the arcade uh, were like Galaga, and later on, it was like NBA Jam and uh, NFL Blitz. Like those were in, you know, more in the 90s. But in the arcade, yeah. anytime you had like Return of the Jedi or the original Star Wars Vector game, um, those were some of my favorites back in the, in the you know, mid 80s, back when I was a little old enough to go into an arcade. Um, 
and, and do some of that, like at the racetracks. And, and then we'd go down to Austin and, and I forgot the name of the place, Grand Prix, maybe I think it was. And, uh, they had a nice arcade there and they had star Wars games there, but yeah, anytime I saw Galaga, but at work, hundred of them in this game and free. So I just kind of troll down there and make time usually on a Friday and skim, you know, spend about 20 minutes down there before I head home. Yeah. What's the highest level you've ever gotten? To? Uh, you know, this is the interesting thing about Galaga is that there are different variations of this game. And so you have, um, and the reason, and how you can tell is on some versions of the game level eight is the one where all of the enemies go out and they don't fire on you. Well, the art, the challenging stage. Yeah. Well, no, uh, before the challenging stage. Oh, right. Right. Where they yeah, just come and out and form. Right. And then so in the starts. game I used to play, that was level 10. Yep. And so, yeah, yeah it's level eight yeah. on some versions of the game. Cause I, I paid really close attention because it's a, just a different variation. And one of my friends back then, we'd always, you know, compare these differences for whatever. Um, so yeah, the, the level I've been able to get to, I quite honestly, I don't always pay attention. I'm thinking it's probably uh, somewhere near 30 or so. Um, with a high score, nice. I think, I think right now I'm second. There's a dude that's got like half a million. I'm like 350,720, I think is my high score. So it's not too bad, but man, that game gets, that yeah, game is pretty difficult <laughs> trying to, to zoom through the, the, the missiles or whatever they're shooting at you. Yeah. Um, I haven't, I mean this, so this is one of the games for me that I really, I really love. And it was always one of the games that, you know, once I did my walk, right, you sized up all the games that are available first to you. And then you figured, okay, where am I pumping my money into? This is one of the ones that I, I'd kind of make a mental note of where it was because I knew I was going to come back to it and play it because it was one of the games where I could throw a quarter in and get a good 20, 30 minutes out of exactly. my prime yeah. today. Not so much, but uh, I think for me, I'm, I re, I distinctly remember getting to level 50. Uh, I don't think I, I don't know where beyond that I ever got to, but just because, you know, in Galaga, you get those special icons every time you get to, you know, you reach a certain level. Um, and, and you get those kind of badges in the bottom right hand corner. Yeah. The purple heart um, thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think you're right. So that was, you know, when I got that, that was like, you know, back off folks, you know, you don't, you don't realize who I am at this point kind of thing. Um, but that was, uh, that was really good. There were some pretty cool concepts in this game too. Like that you mentioned the, the levels where nothing attacked you and you you can just kind of chill out and kill them. That was kind of cool. Um, the challenging stages were also a lot of fun. And that was really just memorization. Right. If you, you knew exactly where to position your ship, you could get those pretty, you know, clear those levels, get a lot of points, that kind of thing. Um, and then the whole dynamic of the, 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 the two ships. So you've got the, uh, the what is it, the Boss Galaga ship that would kind of spin down, and then it would fire the, 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 the tractor beam. And if you were willing to sacrifice your ship, then it would pay off because you would be able to, well, hopefully rescue the ship and then go to double fire. Right. This is all really cool, neat stuff that had never really been done before, folks. So don't I mean, I, mean, I know people are listening, going, well, that's not really cool. No, it really was back in 1981. This is like revolutionary stuff because you really had to make a decision. Do I sacrifice one ship? Even maybe you had only two left two one life left. Do I sacrifice that ship so that I can get double firepower or do I single stay with a single ship? Kind especially, of thing? So, yeah, it especially was just as you start the, getting past level 15 to 20. It gets really hard to keep two ships all the time. So you got to strategize, right? So you're like, okay, well, I'm going to try to get my two ships right before the challenge round because it makes those, because yeah, the, the, even though you memorize the pattern, like I'm old now and so (laughs) kind of old. And so I can't always get over there fast enough. And then the way that the game shoots is that you can shoot faster if you're hitting something, but if you don't, then you only, what is it like two, like a three burst or something like that, roughly. Right. You've got to wait for those to to clear the screen before or be clear up to a certain level. Of right. Fire. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah, you, you have to prioritize a little bit about what you want to do. And the, the interesting thing, Albert, I don't know if I remember, I think the Dreamcast came out with an arcade package. It was the first time I remember the arcade package coming out. I think Galaga was on there. I cannot play Galaga on a console to save my life or an emulator or anything else. Like I, I have to play it on an arcade machine. I, it is, it is not near hmm. as much fun for some reason on anything is it the joystick thing or is it standing up the experience as a whole of standing at the machine i mean and i mean yeah i think it is the joystick and the button must be a muscle memory from back in the day yeah and and trying to use a a game pad or something like that's just it's you know you have an analog stick rather than you know some of these things now and just just not quite the same oh let's move on to defender 
Um, just because we're again, we're we're folks. This is going to be a seven hour show, so I'm just I'm just telling you right now. But you can um, blame me for the earlier stuff, so you can blame me. <laughs> That's all right. Defender. So Defender was uh, ni- again 1981, developed and released by Williams Electronics, and it was developed by a man by the name of Eugene Jarvis, who had uh, again inspiration from Space Invaders and Asteroids. So we'll talk about Asteroids in just a second. So uh, for those of you who don't know, Defender is a two dimensional side scrolling shooter. You were defending your planet from alien abductors. Um, and just a bit of a trivia, a bit of trivia here. The the name Defenders was actually the, uh, uh, Mr. Jarvis had uh, ins- the inspiration from a 1960 show called The Defenders, which was a courtroom drama, I, I guess. I, I mean, that I, I don't know. Makes My perfect name sense. Makes a lot right. of sense. Yes. It makes more sense than some of the other video game or, you know, titles from the from the early 80s, to be honest. So here's my thing real quick, my take on uh, Defender. So Defender was one of these games in the arcade that when you saw it, it was, a- apart from Robotron and and later on, you know, Tron and some of these other ones, but graphically, it was just nuts. There was so much on the screen, right? And if that wasn't enough to intimidate you, the minute you looked down on the board to, to, to where your the controls are, you saw something you probably had never seen. Like most games at this point really had a stick, maybe one one button, maybe two buttons. And here you go. You've got Defender that has a joystick. You've got a thrust button. You've got a fire button, a reverse button, a hyperspace button, and smart bomb button. If you found anybody that was really good and could play this game, it was a lot of fun to watch. I could never really get into this. It was just too complex. And it's one of the criticisms of the game that it really was. It's got a very steep learning curve being able to coordinate. And, and you know, there wasn't a whole lot of, well, I don't know if this is fair to say, but there was, to me, there didn't seem like there was a whole lot of thought put into, one, the placement of those buttons, and two, me as a 10-year-old or 8-year-old, was I going to be able to get my fingers all around it and be able to play it? Um But it was a lot of fun to play, I will say that. And then the home versions, when they came out, they were a little bit more palatable because you really were limited with the number of buttons. You really couldn't do a lot of that stuff. And so they had to they had to work some of these game mechanics into a lot of different things. Like um, I think on the 2600, in order to go to hyperspace, you had to like leave the screen and then it would it warp you, that kind of thing, rather than, you know, having to hit a button and and all of that. So um, let's start with. Uh, let's start with Joe. Joe, did you, is this another one that you did in your little virtual cigarette smoking uh, arcade thing? I did play this in virtual reality. Yeah. Uh, so how do they do the buttons? Did you, what were you using? Like, I don't really get it. Like did, was the layout the same way, with, which I just mentioned, or was it more simplified? No. So the layout's the same. The layout's accurate on all the machines. Um, and I tried to play this with just touch control. So you have like the hand tracking controllers and you would just grab the joysticks or hit the buttons with your hand. Right. But right. The layout is so unintuitive that I have to I had to look at where my hands were in order to do it. So I ended up playing yeah. this one with a controller because it was just not doable. Without the tactile feedback of being able to feel the buttons under my fingers, I couldn't find them while I was trying to play. Nice. Um what did you think of the game as you played it? It was all right. I um <laughs> I've played, dramatic pause. It was all right. I've played Defender well, before. It just it's it was all right. I didn't it wasn't one that ever really stuck with me. Yeah. Yeah. Um Mike, how about you? Is this I, a, is this I, this like you, Albert, it was a little too complex for me back in the day. And it just I thought it was just too much and I'm it's funny because like now it's it wouldn't be like that to me. Like it, it's not a big deal, but I mean, I'd still stink at the game because I stink at every game I play. But that's true. But yes, I do. Um, uh, you should see me playing Far Cry. That's that's lovely uh, with Crawley. That's <laughs> that turns into a disaster. But as Jonesy can tell you, we just go wandering in circles. But anyway, back to this stuff. Uh, I just I just remember it was too much going on in the screen and this way that way. I'm like, this is just not my level, man. It's just, you know, my brother would play it and stuff, and I'd be off going to find something else. And and I, I I don't remember playing it all that much. I just remember I tried a few times, and it was intimidating to me. And I just kind of walked away. And I, later in life, I just never had the interest to get back into it. I should probably jump into it just to try again uh, with with the thing. But again, like like you were talking about, it, it might not be the same. I might need to stand at the at the thing and do it like I would have when I was a kid. But I don't know. Yeah. It'd be interesting. So, but yeah. yeah, it would be. I mean, that that I throw that challenge out to anybody. If you guys ever see this game anywhere, 
you've got a quarter laying around, go ahead and throw it in there and just feel the pain uh, in terms of the, the layout of the buttons and, and how much crap is on the screen and what you're trying to do uh, the entire time. Yeah, it's um, It still feels... Yeah, Jonesy, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, no, I think Joe had It still feels more complicated than it, than it needs to be now. Yeah, Even in the virtual they, they world. probably over-engineered this one, to be fair. Um, Jonesy, did you get a chance to play this? Is this one of the games that's in the, uh, the old cabinet? No, it's there not work? in the cabinet. So I had to find an online emulator, which was very dumbed down. So basically it had effectively an A and a B button. So it was the fire button and the smart bomb. So I recognized the game, but I don't know that I ever played it. And actually what it reminded me of was Choplifter a little bit with the people. I don't know if you guys played mm. that. It's from night. It's from 1982. Oh, yeah. It was an Atari game, but I played it on Commodore 64 uh, when I would at, like go to computer summer camps and things like that. And so it reminded me, I think that was an arcade it was, game. Yeah, too. it was, it was an arcade game. It was on yeah. uh, various uh, Ataris and then on, and on two different Commodores, I believe. Um, but it kind of reminded me of that. I mean, it was probably just the picking up of the people, but I played the, I played the hell out of uh choplifter. And so it, it kind of struck that memory and I was like, I got to go find choplifter and play that. And the, I think it is online, but I just never got a chance to go and actually do it. But no, I, I sucked at this game. And, um, I think, I think my high score was like <laughs> something pathetic because I, I, well, I had I had a work conflict at the last second, so I think I only got up to like thirteen thousand or something crazy. Like really, really, yeah. Uh, to quote Crowley, our friend Crowley over at Bad Gamers and Anonymous, it was bad gamer all the way through. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, this the problem really the controls. Um, I'm not to I'm gonna get off on a tangent here, but no, I won't. I'll probably get on a soapbox. But the the problem with the controls was the joystick. You would think a joystick would move you left, right, up, and down. This moved you up and down only. So if you wanted to go anywhere, you had to press a button to accelerate, right? So that was very and, – and going back to your to your um, comparison to Choplifter, you would move left and right with the controller, up and down with the controller, pick up the people, move them back down, drop them off, and then take off again. That would have eliminated you know 90% of the problems, I think, with, with Defender in the learning curve. Again, I'm not knocking the game because, again, if you – if you found somebody, again, if you go out and look at YouTube, you can find some videos of people that are playing this thing, uh, like actual, the, the actual arcade. And it's amazing to watch just to, to see them be able to to navigate and do all of that. I, I, I don't have that now, kind of The one I played so. online said, kept calling it Defender 2, but it still had 1981 as the, as the copyright date. So was I playing the right version or was there really a second one not all that far from the first one? Um, well, there was, there was a similar game called Stargate. I don't know if that was what you were playing. No, it, it said Defender 2, you know, blue text and all that stuff. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was on the right one. Huh. They just called it Defender in the list, but when it booted up, it called it Defender 2. So I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Stargate is technically Defender 2. That would be probably what you played. And it's just, it's, it's very similar. I, I mean, not only, I think it came out that same year if I'm not, I'm, well, maybe it may have come out the year after I okay. forget now. Um, but yeah, it is, it was a sequel and it, the gameplay was very similar. Uh, the graphics were, I think it used a lot of the same sounds, a lot of the same, um, the enemies and, and all of that as well. So, but yeah, they're very similar in terms of how they played and, and, and all of that, but that would be my guess is what you were playing. Right, I got a D. Yep, <laughs> For Defender. Um, okay, quickly, let's get, let's get to these other two here. So Asteroids, uh, Asteroids was released by Atari um, back in 1979. So we're going back about two years prior to the, the, the first two games we just spoke about. And this is a pretty simple game. You really, you had a little spaceship, you had asteroids that were kind of, you know, floating around on the screen. Your whole objective in this game was really just to shoot the asteroids. Uh, every once in a while, there'd be this like rogue spaceship that would fly by. You'd want to shoot that. And it was really about staying alive and getting points. Um, you could move around if you wanted to, but then now you're dealing with the dynamics of, you know, something blowing up on you. Um, or navigating an asteroid field, much like Han Solo in The Empire Strikes Back. Um, and then there was a couple sequels that came out. There was uh, Asteroids Deluxe in 1981. Uh, they had Space Duel in 82. And then there was another one that was called Blastoids. It was, uh, um, uh, I think it would this would make it part four uh, in 87. And that one was crazy looking, totally different um, in terms of what they were doing there. This is one of those games that when it came out on the 2600, I played eight. I mean, I played this game 
religiously. This was for, I remember one year, this is all I, I think I only did for like a summer was play uh, Asteroids. And it was one of the first games that I remember. We used to call it flipping. I don't know if there's a, a better term, but whenever you got to a certain point in the game and the score, just you max out the score, it would reset to zero. Do you guys remember that happening on some of these games? Uh, Vaguely, but no. I, I'm so old, I don't know. I don't yeah, recall. My memory flipped right. over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but uh, so once you got to like, I don't know, 999,000, the score would, you'd flip it. So it'd go back to zero and you'd start all over again. Are you but, just um, good at, so this is a, a pretty everything, simple game. Albert? Straightforward. <laughs> are you good at What's everything, that? man? Goodness oh, gracious. no, no, I'm not. I, I suck at uh, I, Defender. I was and, horrible at these uh, games. Robocom. I was hearing these like you're flipping the score. I'm like, oh, man. It's intimidating, brother. <laughs> well, no, no, no. If you go, go, if you get a chance to find the Asteroids version, the 2600 port of Asteroids, you will understand that you're, you're playing, you're not, you're playing with a very, very limited uh, uh, challenge. I don't know a better way to say it. It's not, once you figure out the patterns, it's not that difficult. It's not like the arcade game. That's, that's my yeah. opinion. I think the arcade is much more challenging, but well, that's going to be my. Yeah, it's kind of like yeah. Wade says in the book, you know, a, a young kid, you got a whole lot of time on your hands and this is all really there was to do. So this is what I did. Um, how about so let's start with uh, Jonesy. Did you is this one that you played recently? Yeah, here? this was in the art. So I played the arcade cabinet on this one, even down to the the graphics were just a little bit blurry. So it looked like 1979. <laughs> yeah, did it. So this was one of the games that was done with vector yep. graphics as opposed to some of the other ones. But. So the emulator that you, or I guess that arcade cam, it, it, it does the vector yeah, graphics Yeah, it stayed well. pretty true to it, to what I remember growing up. Yeah, nice. so it was just as frustrating as it was back then. So it, I never was a huge Asteroids fan. It, it was okay. It was a little overly simplistic and I just got bored of it more than anything else, which is really weird because it's not like Galaga, you know, changes things up a whole lot either. But um, yeah, for whatever reason, going around the screen. I mean, I remember, you know, flying around and, and doing all that. That was kind of cool, but um, yeah, it, it just didn't really do it for me for whatever reason. Yeah. Joe, did you, did you get a chance to do this one? I did. I played this. Um, it is, it's super simple. It wasn't the most exciting, but uh, it is like the, the original of one of my favorite uh, game categories. You know, now these are like the twin stick shooters and I'm a big fan of those. Uh, it's just instead of twin sticks, you got a bunch of buttons and not really much for graphics, but it's, I mean, it's fun yeah. for a little while, but it does get pretty repetitive. Right. Um, so I don't, I don't mean to wake you up, Mike, but did you get a chance to play asteroids? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not an off day. Yeah. <laughs> nah, no, but it was actually one of my favorites as a kid. So yeah, it, which is funny because I didn't get to play it till later on. It had been around. So this machine was usually open because not a lot of people were playing it at that time. So it was one of those, you know, when the new machine would come in and people would be stopped playing that. And then, you know, I needed some place to go. This would always be there and, and just, I'd play it. And it was fun. Uh, but it does, it is boring. <laughs> I, th I think after you've played it so many times, it's like, yeah, all right. I get that way with a lot of video games, actually, even the modern ones, like first person shooters, I get very bored very easily. Like, it's like, all right, I got, you know, 700 varieties of the gun that I, I like there, but it, it kind of gets old and this gets old too. But then again, when you're wandering around as, as a kid, you're wandering around the arcade and you can't get the, the popular machine or whatever, you don't can't check it out or whatever. And you don't feel like sitting there in that room watching one or two people play the game. You go and find the game that no one's playing. And that was one of them actually at my arcade. But yeah, you got kind of relegated to the, you know, yeah, whatever. Exactly. Which, which you know, happened to playing. me with the Atari too, with my father, my brother, everybody got to play it, but me. So I get to play, you know, whenever I never got yeah. to be the first guy at the machine, but anyway, that's story of my life. Yep. Um, okay. And then the last one was Robotron 2084, uh, released in 1982 by Williams Electronics, um, developed again by Eugene Jarvis. So this is the same gentleman that, um, did Defender, uh, in Stargate and Larry DeMar. Um, and Wade does, or in the book, I guess, Ernest Klein has Wade kind of describe a, a little bit of, of, of the uh, the game and the game mechanics. Um, but what you're doing is basically you're running around, you've got twin sticks, you've got robots um, that have turned against you. So this is kind of like a Skynet kind of thing. Um, and your whole purpose is really to save the last human family. So you're running around trying to rescue these people with the, an onslaught of robots. So 
This particular game was one that I really, really enjoyed because for me, I got all the same sounds from Defender and Stargate. I have all the same graphics. And if, if you listen to the sounds, by the way, they actually repurposed some of the sounds from Defender in Robotron. Um, but it's so fast paced. It's so phonetic. Um, and it, it went on to inspire a number of other games like Smash TV, if you guys remember that one. Um, there was uh, Total Carnage, I think, from 1982. Um, there was a couple sequels um, specifically to Robotron um, that were released. It, there was a an official sequel was planned in 1983, but because of the video game crash, uh, it never got released. Um, there was, uh, I think that was called Blaster. Uh, there was Robotron X in 1996. Um, so Joe, we're getting into your territory here. So that was on the Nintendo 64. Uh, I'm sorry. That was, uh, Robotron X, I think was on the PlayStation, if I'm not mistaken. I may be wrong there. Uh, there was Robotron 64, which was for the N64. And that was just kind of a, a Nintendo 64 port of that one. Um, but yeah, so going back to, to, to this particular one, this was a really a fun game for me. There was just so much stuff blowing up on the screen. It was super fast. It was super fast paced. You didn't, you know, you had two controllers, you run around, one moved you, one shot, you know, shot in whatever direction you pointed it in. Um, and it was just, sometimes you, sometimes these levels would be over so quick, uh, because these enemies would just, they would descend on you so fast that, you know, if you timed it just right, you could really wipe out a number of them pretty quickly, rescue the human, then you'd be on to the next level. Um, so with that, Mike, does this, uh, is this another game that you, uh, were relegated to not playing or was this something that you was, was something you got a chance to do? It didn't do anything for me, so I never really played it. What? I tried. Yeah, it didn't do anything for me for whatever reason. I just didn't really, I didn't care for it. I don't know why. I just didn't. Uh, I remember playing it a couple of times because of, again, this was last week though, right? Y- no, no, <laughs> no, this wasn't. No, unfortunately I didn't get to play it. I probably would have skipped this one even if if I got time to play it. I wouldn't have. Uh, I wouldn't have played it. But anyway, uh, yeah. So it, it never did anything for me. I just I don't know what it was. It just didn't. It didn't click for me. And that's not saying it wasn't a fun game for other people like you or whatever you liked it or whatever. But for me, it just didn't do anything for me. But yeah. sorry, didn't mean to ruin no, the you're party. Fine. I'll Jonesy? go back to sleep now. No. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't I'll remember playing this here. one, but yeah, okay. I really enjoyed watching other people play it because it, it was just pandemonium it was just chaos and yeah so watching someone who was really good at it like it was one of those you could like just sit there and watch them play it even though you, you have nothing invested and just didn't watch them go to town on it but no I, I don't remember playing this game at all and like i said i had to kind of refresh my memory as to what it was so um but yeah that's it yeah and yeah joe how about you i liked this uh it was hard in vr without any real tactile feedback but i liked it i'm probably gonna get this set up to play on the monitor and play a little more of this nice yeah and i don't know this was one of the ones when it because it required two joysticks or two controllers unless you're playing the arcade i would argue that you're not getting the full experience right um but i can see they 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 did some pretty um some pretty cool stuff with with the control pads and and being able to kind of replicate that feel. I mean that that spirit of the carnage or total mayhem is not lost in in a lot of the sequels and the ports and that kind of thing. So I think that's all in in stock, um, still intact. But um, just being able to have two controllers, I think, is is kind of a big deal. That was that was kind of one of the the hooks, I guess, so to speak. When you saw this game, it had two controllers on it, where a lot of games at that time only had again one one button, maybe two buttons if it was, you know, kind of fancy. So, um, so let's, let's move on to, um, so we'll get off this and, and, and kind of roll just cause we're, we're coming up on our first hour here, but, um, so let's go back to the book. So it's also in this moment, uh, of the novel that Wade mentions his living quarters and conditions, you know, he's kind of a step above Harry Potter. He's not living under the staircase, but he's, uh, bunking in the laundry room that, you know, of a double wide trailer, uh, with his aunt Alice and her boyfriend, who I like to affectionately refer to as shirtless Rick. Um, and the rest of the house smells like, you know, cat urine. And, you know, he mentions abject poverty, which I, I laugh every time I read that. Um, uh, but, you know, because he's in the laundry room, he gets the sweet smell of like liquid detergent and fabric softener, which for whatever reason I could relate to, because it, it, growing up, I was, um, I think right, right when I turned 18, I moved out into my parents' garage and it was uh, the laundry room was kind of right backed up to that. So, you know, in the summer, in the wintertime when it was cold, I was getting some of the warmth from the dryer whenever the clothes was going on. But one of the things that I just 
the things that stuck with me is that remembering what the fabric softener smelled like or the dryer sheets and all that. So I don't know, for whatever reason, this resonated me, with me for some stupid reason. But um, he mentions that there's three families living there and there's 15 people all living into this in this double wide. Uh, but then he kind of goes on to say that everybody's pretty comfortable and there's there's plenty of room. Um, uh, after receiving the game over message, uh, because, you know, he's playing Robotron 2084. You know, mind you, I'm I'm guessing this is probably like at two in the morning that he started his little um, kick on playing some of these old cart arcade classics. And he starts to kind of doze off and he starts losing his hand-eye coordination. And instead of going back to sleep, what does he do? Well, he fires up Family Ties, which he mentions is Halliday's favorite TV show, one of favorite his TV shows of all time. And he doesn't exactly say it in these terms, but we really, we, we kind of come to understand that Wade loses himself in the show, much like he does with the arcade games um, or just the, or, or the Oasis in general. And as the chapter continues to play out, we see just how dystopian the future really is and how dark Wade's view of the real world is and how people like Wade and most of America at this time choose to kind of live vicariously through shows, games, you know, the Oasis itself. Um, and then, he, you know, just to quote Wade, he says, uh, because the real world sucked. And going one step further, if you quote uh, Halliday at this time, he says, being human totally sucks most of the time. So um, I thought that was a pretty good setup because we're going to talk about family ties now. And if there was anything, <laughs> if there was one show, well, there's, there's several, we could probably mention several shows in the 80s. But this is one of those feel good shows that came on that was a huge, huge hit. I mean, uh, I don't know how else to, to express this outside of saying, go look up you know, some of the reviews and, and what it was like when this show was on. But Family Ties was really one of those shows that a lot of America was watching. And it was just in that he kind of mentions it in that 30 minutes, they solved some some really, you know, uh, important issues of the time. So uh, let me let me just set up Family Ties and then I'll kick it over to one of you here. So Family Ties ran from 82 to 89. Uh, it was created by Gary D uh, David Goldberg. It ran for seven seasons on NBC. And really, they dealt with a lot of like social, economic and political issues of the 80s. And it was a really cool dynamic because the parents were hippies that were coming from the 60s. And they had this uh, their oldest son, which was Michael, um, or, sorry, Michael Keaton, um, the, uh, the Michael, character played by Michael J. Fox, yeah. Alex P. Keaton. He was a Republican, like a staunch Republican, too. So he was very conservative. And um, so you had this like, you know, two sides of the political spectrum in the same family. And for all their differences and all the differences of their political views, you know, there was you you got this sense of that the whole family really just kind of, you know, loved each other. Um, so you had Stephen and Elise Keaton uh, were the parents. Um, you had Alex Keaton again, who is Michael J. Fox. You had the fashionista, which was uh, Mallory, played by Justine Bateman. Um, then you had Jennifer, which was Tina Yothers, and she was kind of this this tomboy character. And then I think later on in season five, they have another little boy that was played by Brian uh, Bonsall. And I, I don't even remember that dude's name anymore, to be honest. Um, but uh, so let's, let's talk about family ties. You mean Mark, Oliver? Uh, was he Oliver? From, was it Oliver? Yeah. From, from uh, what is it? The Brady Bunch? No, I'm just kidding. No, that's not Oliver. Well, cause Oliver kind of was there. Then he disappeared. I just, you know, anyway. Yeah. I remember that kid too. Um, so, Mike, since you're awake, what oh, yeah. uh, was <laughs> this? Was this something that you watched? Oh yeah, uh, yeah it was like a, yeah, well, yeah, it was like everyone else. We all got around, watched the show, and it, it was pretty cool. It, for I remember for me when I was because I was younger when I was watching, and you know, I kind of grew up with the show, and it was weird because I I was in this like I got interested into the. I guess the political aspects of it. It's it's funny because then I I got in. I kind of it helped pique my interest into other things that are more, I guess, adult for that, uh, for a kid of my age at that time. Like, like when I was seven, eight, nine and all that stuff. And, and, you know, I was watching things I probably shouldn't have been watching, but that's, I'm a latchkey kid. That's what we did. You know, I remember even watching Carson every night when I shouldn't have been watching Carson because I had a little black and white TV and I could, I could watch that and stuff. And it made me Monday night football back in the day. It was I shouldn't oh, have been, yeah. yeah, I shouldn't have been watching. Uh, yeah. You, what were you doing up that late? Go to bed. Uh, I'm the night owl. Which is funny because now I'm ready to pass out because I'm old. But in any case, I'm still uh, a night owl. But yeah, I grew up lo loving the show. And I, I, Alex, I always liked uh, him the best. I don't know why, because I'm not really like a conservative or anything like that. I just liked his character for some reason. I like the dynamic of 
of the old hippy dippy uh, parents, and then the, they, they end up having a conservative son, and then yeah. you know button heads and stuff. I thought it was really great, but it, the, the the main point was that they all came together at the end, and they were they were a family, and they all loved each other, and they tried to you know solve the world's problems in a half hour, which was every show really when you think about it. It's still, yeah. I guess now it's an hour. I guess they give you like an hour or something to to solve everything, but. Uh, I did enjoy it. It was it was a popular show for a reason. I didn't realize it was on this long, to be honest. I think that just surprised me that it was on that long, which is weird because I didn't think it started in 82. I thought, you know, I think I came in to be with it around 1984. I don't remember the early earlier stuff with it. But anyway, that's my experience with it. I, uh, I would like to see it again. I'd actually I, th- I don't think I'd have a problem. I know on TV land, they run those all those old shows and it's funny. It all comes back to you. And you remember all these things, and I don't recall Family Ties being on there, but I imagine it should be. So at some point, I'll, I'll I will catch an episode or two just to to reminisce. Yeah, if you have, um, and admit this maybe I don't know how you guys. So the homework assignment was really to watch, uh, four episodes at least, or bonus points if you watched all of season one. Um, but if you have, um, so if you have Amazon Prime. I do. On Prime Video, you can watch all of the, all seven seasons. They have every single one of the episodes there. Um, so, highly recommend go, going to to watch the show. Um, Jonesy, how about you? Was this something that was on the the, the TV back home? Oh yeah, back we then? had Family Ties, Growing Pains. I mean, the whole smorgasbord of of eighties family sitcom. Yeah, Cosby. Cosby. I mean, they were just staples in our house, and I. I could echo a lot of what Mike already said, but one of the things that struck me, cause I did go to Amazon prime and started watching uh, season one. What struck me was like how most pilot episodes in that first season, it really takes them a while to find their rhythm, but family ties just kind of snapped right to it. So when you watch, when you watch episode oh, yeah. one and then you go watch an episode, you know, several seasons down the road that, you don't really feel like there's this huge disconnect between the, between the shows. I mean, clearly it got a little bit better as the cast got more formed, especially Justine Bateman was a little off putting early on was a little, a little rigid, but, um, but yeah, they really snapped to it. And much like Mike, I gravitated towards or gravitated towards Michael J. Fox's character. And he was just so dynamic compared to the rest of the cast. I mean, he was just all over the place, this eccentric kid, you know, super smart, you know, always driving, you know, driving some cockamini idea and, and the suits and everything else was just totally out of character for every other kid who's in high school. And so it was just so much fun to watch it. And I was a, I, it, it prompted me to go watch Spin City again. Cause I, I, I liked Spin City a lot, yep. which is another, uh, uh, Gary David Goldberg. That's yeah. Gary yeah Goldberg. Back in the late nineties, uh, with, again, with Michael J. Yep. Fox. Um, what, which was a great show too. I, it I really, really was. That, I used to watch um, uh, Spin City out. and then uh, News Radio was another one I really enjoyed uh, back in the time. And yeah. uh, but no, yeah, I, I, it just it struck me how how good the episodes were even early on. And one of the ones I saw on YouTube when I was originally looking was a Tom Hanks episode, and I had completely forgot that Tom Hanks guest starred on T- Family Ties as the drunk uncle who was getting a yeah. That episode's called yeah, Say Uncle, and and it just. You talk about, you know, times and, and, and those, you know, or the social issues and things like that. And it just, it struck me that, wow, they, they really were tackling some of these things. And, and I happened to watch a Growing Pains episode where they d- tackled teenage drinking and things like that as well. And so it was just curious to see these things in our family TV shows. And they were very much accepted, even though if they were a little bit challenging at the time for parents about whether they wanted their kids to watch them, but at the end of the day, they were always trying to put forth a good message uh, that, that people could learn and grow from, which I, which I kind of miss. I, I, you know, we don't have this today for the most part. Yeah, I would agree. And in, in, in watching a lot of these episodes, like especially like the father. Um, so played by it was Michael Gross that was playing Stephen, the father. You know, watching these episodes at the very end of the episode, they would say, I screwed up, son. I'm sorry for this. I'll try to do better. And I'm thinking, man, dad never did that. I never had my parents come apologize for what they did, whether they knew they were right or wrong. And it, I mean, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of joking because my, my dad is, was not this gentleman and, and he's a totally different kind of background kind of thing. But um, it was just, it was like eye opening that parents that you had parents that were, you know, so vulnerable and, and, and being able to just, you know, confess that they are human and they have flaws and they have error, you know, they error. Uh, all that, it was just so, so different. And, and again, that's part of it. It's like, it's part of that, 
that whole uh, mysticism, the dynamic of do you have a family that had all these issues and at the very end of the episode, you know, whether it was 30 minutes or 60 minutes, they would reconcile everything and, and all agree that try to do better next time, which was so, you know, you know, out of touch with me, at least for me, like in my family dynamic. Something that we surprised were doing, but, me though, for being 1982 was that the interaction between the parents was actually fairly sexual. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, know. And just in her character is constantly making, she's like, you know, that was kind of like the running gag. I think in, at least in the first season, uh, Mallory would always walk in on them and they're, you know, she's sitting on his lap, they're smooching or, you know, making these little, you know, comments and that kind of thing. But yeah, you're right. There was the sexualism there between the parents was another one. They're like, well, parents do this kind of thing. Well, and it, was, it was a great tie back to their backstory of, you know, being hippies and whatnot. You know, and Meredith Baxter wasn't mm-hmm. too hard on the eyes either. So, oh, she was gorgeous in the seventies. Well, she was gorgeous in this, in this, but in the seventies, she was go. Yeah, she's well. I don't wanna get creepy here. Too late, uh, Joe. Save me. What? Um, yeah, no, Joe. How about you? Did you? So, <laughs> I'm really interested to hear your opinion on this because as I watched this, as I was watching, and I was thinking, I don't know if Joe's gonna like these because some of these are coming off a little bit cheesy at times. But what did you think about? Did you get a chance to watch any episodes? If so, what did you think about the show? Yeah, I watched the first five or six. And then after uh, talking to you a little bit in the Discord about it, I went and watched the Say Uncle episode. Um, I think the thing I didn't like about it is the thing that you guys liked most about it. I didn't really grow up with that like super formulaic, every episode has a moral of the story kind of thing. And I Mm -hmm. didn't really like that, that it just felt like I was watching the same episode every time. I mean, the, the, yep. the subject changed, but it was very much felt repetitive. It was very formulaic. Um, but I love Michael J. Fox. Uh, I didn't dislike the show. I don't think I'm going to watch any more of it, but I had fond memories of it going in though. Cause I remember watching it on like Nick at night. Maybe it might've been TV land when I was younger. But I think I was, I think I was too young to know what I was really watching, and everything went over my head, and I just thought it was funny. Uh, but a lot of the stuff that they cover thematically is pretty applicable today in our current political climate, which I appreciated. Yeah, I would, I would, I'd agree there. Um, some of the themes and, and stuff that they they were dealing with. Um, going back to that say uncle episode. So for those of you who haven't seen it, I'd recommend watching it because you get to see a very young Tom Hanks, um, uh, play, uh, what's her name? Now I'm gonna forget her name. Uh, Elisa's brother, uh, who comes over to the house and he's got a drinking problem. Um, they're trying to get him a job and he's, you know, kind of raiding the fridge, drinking beer. I think at one point he, he drinks all of the vanilla extract. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, and Michael J. Fox is kind of aware that, OK, he's got a serious problem. So he tries to make his parents aware um, and, you know, they're dealing with this. But then there's like this one moment and I don't I won't spoil it, but there's one moment that's just like shocking. You're like, what the heck? Like even today, if we were watching television shows, I don't know that there's again for for normal like NBC. Tele- well, I shouldn't say that. It, I can see it happening today. But you got to remember, this is back in but for like, a 82. family for a family and, show. You're absolutely right. Right, it was, exactly. It, was, it, it took me. A, it took me a moment. I had to pause and like <laughs> think about it, rewind what just it. Happened and I was like, really? Did we just watch that? Yeah, yeah, but that was like in the '80s. They always did that big, you know, controversial type of episode where people would tune in, especially with the ratings were sliding a little. They'd do an episode like this just to get people talking and everything. It, they always do that. They still do that in a, in a degree. Although I don't think you can shock people that much today. And it's interesting that Joe says, you know, I can't watch the the whole, you know, we start from here and we end here in the episode. And then the next week, it's a completely different uh, tale, so to speak. And it doesn't really relate to the first one there. It's interesting how that is now, where it's like we like to binge and the season's got to mean something and connect everything. It, it's crazy yeah. how everything's kind of changed now. So that like is pretty of, interesting. But I grew continue. up in a really yeah. conservative household, too, though, in, in Central Texas. And so... Some of these types yeah. of things, like the whole hippie angle in, in episodes like that. And I watched another one where Alex was uh, taking speed to stay awake for exams or something like that. And so topics like that were just never discussed in my family. I mean, we didn't, we didn't talk about yeah. these types of things until I was in my mid to late 20s. Hmm. Well, I mean, so, so if you just bring it back to the book, 
he mentions in the book that he he gets about he's like in episode four of his marathon. And if you go if he if he started with episode one of season one and he ends on episode four, episode four um, is an episode called Summer of 82. And in that episode, Alex loses his virginity at 17 and they're not really pulling any punches punches about about this. Uh, which again, to me, was kind of like, whoa! I didn't realize they would. They were hand, They were kind of covering these types of topics. Um, you know, he loses his virginity, and he's you know heartbroken because you know this girl is a college girl, and she's like, you know, whatever. It's just you know, it's it's just a thing. It's not. It doesn't mean anything. And to him, of course, he's you know head over heels, and he's already talking marriage. I think at one point he comes out and he's wearing like the Hugh Hefner smoking jacket, and he whips out a pipe because he's you know planning the rest of his life with this girl and, and she's, you know, not thinking that, but, but anyways, the, the point of that was really just to say that, uh, I guess Jonesy made that, 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 uh, the comment earlier that they were, they were talking about things like that, that in my household, we were not talking about these things. And even, even if we watched this episode, it didn't spark any conversation that <laughs> was just, yeah, that's just TV. We're not going to talk about that kind of thing. So go to bed, kids, go to bed. Yep. Go <laughs> to bed. Yep. Should have been in bed already. <laughs> Pretty um, much. The uh, I guess the only other thing I'll say about Family Ties, and we didn't really touch on it, was the theme song. Uh, the theme song is one of the ones like even it's you can you love it or hate it. It's it sticks with you for whatever reason. Um, or maybe I'm just weird. Maybe I'm an Oigo oh, it's fan, right, but it's right. That was more the, like, it's, it's right up there with like Cheers God. as like things that you recognize. Yeah, but the Cheers right. one is good the, though. Yeah, the Cheers one is pretty awesome. I can't believe By the you, way, you the, got an Oingo Boingo reference in. Ugh. Yeah, I did, didn't I? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Lucky so you. let's just let's uh, get the final vote on the theme song, Mike. Is this something that uh, that you enjoy? Yeah, it's all right. I mean, it's the theme song. It sticks in your head. It's I mean, it's no Star Wars theme song, but you know, it's it's cool. It's fine. All right. Well, go back to bed. We'll wake you up when we get to X Men here. Hey, get off my lawn, kids. All right. Yeah. All right, so let's get back to the book. Um, all right, so after we get this brief moment of escapism with family ties, uh, we get some background into his father, who was shot dead uh, when Wade was a kid when he was looting a grocery store uh, during a blackout, which is kind of kind of sucks because it, you know you would like to think that he was you know looting to provide for his family. That's how I interpreted it, that he may have been provo- you know rather than just being some you know strung out uh, drug person or druggy or whatever, but. Um, anyways, he shot, um, and sadly he says that the only thing he really ever knew about him was that he loved comic books and, um, Wade finds an old flash drive and on there, he's got a, he's got complete runs to the amazing Spider-Man, the X-Men and Green Lantern. So this takes us to our next three pop culture references. And we'll make these pretty quick because I mean, honestly, you could do a whole show on any one of those three really. Um, but what I'd ask you guys was just to kind of familiarize yourself with three of them. Um, Let's talk about Amazing Spider-Man um, first off. So uh, that was released in oh, 1962, 63. Shoot. I think it's 62. Um, but I want to save that for chapter 26 because chapter 26 talks about uh, Spider-Man. So we'll we'll get into that a little bit later because that was one of <laughs> one of the, the cool moments, I think, in the book for me um, that Klein brought that up. But um do you guys have a favorite Spider-Man portrayal? Let's just go with the actors. Who is the best Spider-Man uh, from the movies so far? And Mike, let's how about let's start with you. Uh, I would say the Topher dude. There is that his name? Is it Toby Topher McGuire. or whatever? The twelve. Yeah, that <laughs> dude. Topher, I think, Topher no, I'm was, of that other was guy. Venom that, ish. Yeah, yeah, he was Venom. That's what I get confused there. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I think he did the the best so far. Tobey Maguire. Yeah, Joe, think, what about you? Yeah. Who's, who's your, who gets your vote? Uh, I think the new kid. Uh, I'm blanking on his name. Um, homecoming. I'd give him a. You'd put him in number two for me. I but, think he was. Yeah, I, I, I think he was better. Yeah, Tom Holland. Tom Holland. Thank yeah, you. I'm a huge Spider-Man yeah, fan. Yeah, you're yeah, probably yeah, not <laughs> What about you? Actually, you Jonesy? know the one that I like the most isn't isn't in the movies. It was the '90s cartoon, and I, I cannot remember the guy's name. <laughs> is it, is it because of the memes that come out of that? Oh no, no, that's the '60s. But, cartoon, but another right? fun one I was think. remember MTV um, rebooted Spider-Man as more of a uh, a more modern take. And do you know who the voice of Spider-Man and Peter Parker was? Oh, I no, I'll give not you off the top of my head. It's legendary. It's legendary. <laughs> no, who is Crap, it? No. Oh, it's going to be Mike. Neil Patrick, Neil Patrick Harris. Harris there, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I got the reference. Yeah. Wow. I didn't, I didn't realize that was him. I was thinking of someone but else. Yeah, but... I, I really watched a lot oh. of the cartoon. I mean, 
for the movies, yeah, Tobey Maguire really brought it to life. That was the first one that really seemed to nail it. But the 90s cartoons and the 2000s cartoons were really one that that solidified it for me. And even with the um, the most recent one, it's no longer, I think it was called Spectacular Spider-Man, was actually really, really well done for, uh, for an animated series as well. Yeah. Um, so I, if I'm, I actually am not a Tobey Maguire fan. I never, I, I would, I'm a huge Spider-Man fan. In fact, I've got, I probably have a close to three, four, well, I'm probably more than that now because I forgot about a series. Probably about, I'd say about 400 comics uh, in boxes that uh, my wife hates that they're here. But um, so when those movies came out, I was super excited. I wasn't so crazy about Ray, uh, Sam Raimi kind of doing that. But at the same time, I was pretty open to it. I didn't really like his portrayal. Um, and maybe because I was on an Ultimate Spider-Man kick at the time, which is a, a, a kind of a spinoff series of that in the Ultimate Universe at the time. Um, and I was really looking for that. And I don't think I got it with Tobey Maguire. No, yeah, it was um, much more traditional. So I would, yeah, much more traditional that, than Ultimate was. Ultimate was a great series. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. And that's that's what I was looking for is more of the um, the Ultimate series, which I think I got from Garfield to some extent. But I think Tom Holland probably does a good job. I think he's probably my favorite because for me, my favorite Spider-Man wasn't, you know, the Spider-Man of the 80s and, and 90s or 2000s. Well, 2000s, really, because it was really the Ultimate Spider-Man. I think I get that with, with Tom Holland. Oh, so I loved the um, uh, I even loved the old 60s Spider-Man cartoon. And of course, then Spider Man and his yeah, amazing yeah. friends. Oh, that's a, that theme song is. Da, 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 oh, da, da, da. That's that's just stuck in my head. No, no, do that again, please. No, I'll, I'll do it again. No, no, right, Spider Man. No, no, I mean, that's like the one one of the all time. Oh, that's yeah. the, one of the best theme songs. Yeah. That is a better theme song than Family Ties. That I'll is one hundred and ten percent true. Definitely. I think the Ramones did that too, and a cover of that, by the way. If you haven't heard that, that's that's pretty good. Yeah. Um. All right. Let's talk about X Men. Uh. Give me your favorite. Yeah, we're going to talk okay. about X-Men. Give me your favorite. We'll start with you, Jonesy. But give me your favorite and your least favorite. X-Men. Oh, my God. Least favorite. That's going to be tough. You, you know, Wolverine is is my favorite. But I, I got to throw in Cyclops because I really liked Cyclops' character. I mean, the leadership at, you know, side of things, which I always gravitated towards. My brother was a huge Wolverine fan. So we had tons of Wolverine comics. I think he even had the second one. We never could quite afford the first one. But so we were huge uh, Wolverine fans as well, but I, I really liked Cyclops through it. And I liked him in the X-Men movies as well, especially his dynamic with, uh, with Wolverine, but um, man. So the original with, uh, was it Mark, is it Mark Madsen or Mark? Yeah. Mark's that yeah. guy, or are you talking no, about the one. reboot with uh, our buddy from Ready Player no, One? Yeah. It, yeah. From the nineties X-Men movies that started with, uh, yeah, Marston, whatever his name is. Uh, Superman's yeah, okay. stalker love interest, <laughs> whatever he was in Superman <laughs> Returns. Um, man, least favorite. That's tough. Um, I was never a huge Colossus Storm. fan. <laughs> to be honest with you, it's just boring. Yeah. Oh, Storm that breaks my heart. That's that's Kitty Pride's, you know, yeah. man. Yeah. Man. I mean, I always wanted to like Beast more than I did too, and I in the the cartoon. I thought he was fantastic. That's where I ended up loving Beast was from the the, the cartoon. Um, so you didn't like the Kelsey Grammer? Actually, I didn't mind that either. I, I thought Kelsey, but I'm saying that's where I had a bit a much better appreciation for for Beast in general. I think the the uh, movie versions yeah. of Beast have actually been pretty good, even in uh, including X Men First Class uh, type of era too. I think they've done a good job. Yeah, I, I think that. Yeah, you're right. I think I would agree. They've I, done a pretty good job. I just job. think they didn't give, uh, Kathy, at, at least in the it. movies, I didn't read as many of the books with Colossus. It just seemed like he never had anything to do, you know? Yeah, he was yeah, just a strong yeah, guy. Just nothing, they didn't really develop him all that well. Yeah, I would say if you get a chance, look at the Joss Whedon run. Um, he did a lot with uh, Kitty Pride and him, but. Um, all right, so your least favorite. Okay, so Joe, how about you? Uh, um, favorite and least favorite. So same Wolverine. I feel like Wolverine's a lot of people's favorites, but he's just so cool. Uh, these favorites tough. Um, I actually never really liked Cyclops all that much. Uh, Ooh. Geek fight. Geek fight. <laughs> Joe, go. Joey's going to have problems with me from now on. Uh, yeah, he is. How could you oh. not like the red sunglasses? You're breaking my heart. <laughs> Don't do it, Annie. Don't do it. No, wrong podcast. <laughs> I have the high ground. Oh, well, yeah, that is <laughs> oh, wrong. Boy. Yeah, sorry. Wrong one. He always, hey, Joe, Cyclops always just kind of felt stuck up to me. Uh, 
Stop that. He's, <laughs> he asked you if you were an angel. This is more Star Wars reference. I apologize, folks. Yeah. Uh, Joe, sorry. What were you saying about Cyclops? Or what, do you, what did you not like about it him? It just kind of felt stuck up to me, I guess. Mm. Played it too much by the... Uh, too straight-laced, you know? I don't know. Yeah. Well, he was always like the... Def- like, he was the leader... And whether he wanted to be the leader or not, that was always his lot in life. And I think he struggled with that at times. And, you know, then you got Mr. You know, Wolverine coming in and, and moving in on his territory with Jean Grey. And yeah. you know, he always had that dynamic. See, uh, yeah, I always use Cyclops as like the, the, the parent figure when Professor X wasn't there, though. I mean, he really had to keep the team yeah. together. And even with Jean's powers, it she still deferred to him as well. Um, as just the the clear leadership, you know, position that he was in, and but yeah, he was kind of like the older yeah, brother. Maybe that's a little bit better. Yeah, older know, brother. Yeah, he really didn't have a choice. But you know, when dad was away, he got he was de facto leader. So, um, Mike, what about you? X Men favorite, least favorite? My uh, my favorite probably Professor X and nice good w- choice and Wolverine, obviously because I like his attitude, and uh, well, but, but that might be more of with uh. Hugh Jackman there, the way he portrays him and and stuff. Although I didn't, I, I liked Logan, the movie Logan, but I didn't like it that much. Oh, it's a great movie. But I loved it. It was better than The Last Jedi, and we got the father daughter story that I was looking for. So I'll give it that. Wow. I mean, it was much better than that. But uh, in any case, my least favorite, I don't know. I I say Storm. I don't know. Maybe it's her powers. Whoop de doo. You control the weather for five seconds. I don't know. Doesn't do much for me. And maybe even Magneto because he's kind of just just a tool. I don't know. I, oh. Sure, it's cool. He's got his magnetic power, but he's really just kind of a, I don't know. He's just so condescending. <laughs> it just bothers me. He's not a good mm. bad guy in my mind, but that's just me. I I, am, I love Magneto. Um, all right. So my favorite X-Men. Um, Nightcrawler. No. Uh, no, it's not Nightcrawler. Um, man, that one's tough. Mystique. I, no. I do like Mystique. Mystique, though. You could put her on my list if you want, but... Uh. <laughs> Let me let me answer that right now for you. Thank you very much. Um, so th- I'm gonna. This is gonna sound weird because William always accuses me of going out and and doing like these obscure characters. But there's a, a particular character named Zorn. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him. Z- Why would we hear of him? No one heard of him, but you. I, well, <laughs> if you follow X Men, you've heard of him. Trust me, because there's a whole series that ran where. Zorn was really Magneto. Sorry, spoiler alert. If you haven't read this, well, you just ruined it all for us. Now, thank yep. you. Yep. If you've introduced, they introduced this character named Zorn, uh, who has like this sun in his head kind of thing, and he's got all these powers to be able to heal mutants and all of that. Sorry about that. Um, and, and anyways, so the whole you get to the very end and you realize it's just Magneto. Well, Zorn became such a popular character that they actually brought him back, and you know they retconned it uh, to to a large extent, which. I was okay with because I really enjoyed the character, but I just thought it was a really neat uh, background origin. So sorry, I don't really have anything that's um, probably too familiar. Um, but of course, why would you? Why would you? Yeah. Not? Well, yeah. so my least favorite is though. So Jubilee is my least favorite character. I think it's just she's a waste of, of a mutant. I mean, she's got powers that you know, happy lights. I don't even. I can. I, I may be completely wrong there. People but need that to was be always... happy, Albert. Okay, I could use oh, a little. So bit. what do you think about a character like Gambit then? <laughs> yeah, he's a waste. <laughs> He's just a waste, but Gambit, uh, no, he was, he was cool. I mean, he could charge anything. I mean, I guess it was, he had the cards, right? But I mean, his power was that he really could, uh, charge any object. And there was some, I thought there were some pretty cool runs where, or some cool things that he did or how they, they allowed him to use that power. Um, yeah, I didn't mind him so much. I hated the, his look in the eighties with the whole headband, the trench coat. I thought they did a better job as he got, and they got rid of all of that. All right, so um, Green Lantern. So let's talk Green Lantern just real quick. Um, yeah, no, we shouldn't even do that. But but that's okay. Are any of you guys Green Lantern fans? I don't Not like at DC Comics really at all. I actually I do love DC Comics better than Marvel, but Green Lantern is not the the shining example we'd want to. Uh, to bring out here, but at least in all my right, Jonesy. Yeah. How about you? Are you a DC fan? You like Green um, Lantern? I'm a pseudo DC fan. I like bits and pieces of it. Green Lantern never really spoke to me. I I liked Green Lantern in the Justice League cartoons. Oh, all right. Yes, that's exactly okay, where that's, I was yeah, that's because that's uh, cool. and, and who that's was the? Fair. It wasn't. He was John. That was John I, I liked the John Stewart version of of Green Lantern. The Hal Jordan one was just way 
too typical for me, you know, the pilot with the bad attitude and things like that and, um, and, and whatever, whatever. But I really liked the, then you had Guy Gardner with the bull <laughs> yeah. haircut. But I really liked, uh, John Stewart in the Justice League cartoons. I thought that was really well done I've written, and very well voice acted too. Yeah. That was a great, great animated series. I really enjoyed that. It was, it was a bit, I mean, they, they kind of pushed it on kids, but it was a little bit, I thought too slow, not slow paced, um, uh, because I enjoyed it as an, you know, I was a, a lot older to be fair, but I, I always thought kids would be turned off by, it, but it, it did pretty good. I mean, I, I didn't have kids at the time, but they, uh, the kids that I knew that did watch it or family members that, that were younger that watched it, they were all into it too. But yeah, I would say, I would agree. John Stewart was my favorite because of the series, but even in the comics and I'll be honest, Green Lantern is not something I follow closely. I don't have this in my collection. Um, but it is one that, you know, I, I at least keep a pulse on. And I thought he was always like the, the, the things that were of them. And yeah, the things that were off putting about Green Lantern were just some of the silly things they made him do with the ring. And like the, I mean, sometimes it was yeah. fun, but often it was just ridiculously over the top, like a giant hand or a giant baseball bat or something, you know, kind of crazy and silly. And sometimes it was just very out of the moment or I don't even want to say out of character, but just out of the moment. And it, yeah, it was just like too much. Well, and that's probably true of, well, I, so to be, my opinion of, of DC is, and in, in, in at least until recently has been, that's been my biggest problem with them. And it's probably, I don't want to speak for Joe, but when you look at DC and, and, and Marvel, they kind of give you a lot of, um, they kind of, a lot of that's not there, the baseball bats. I mean, if you look at Superman, Batman, there are some, especially when you're talking about like, you know, 50s, 60s, and even in the 70s, there's some really corny plot lines. Not to say Marvel was excluded. They've got their fair share of really corny stuff out there as well. But just in terms of what the content and, and the storylines and what they were dealing with, um, I think is what kind of set them apart. And and for some fans, that's fine. I think a lot of people, well, I know a lot of people really enjoy even the older DC storylines um, as opposed to the Marvel. But it was just, it's just something that I never really related to. I like the people that were vulnerable, that were making mistakes and, um, you know, they weren't getting like, like you said, the big bats and that kind of thing. It just, that never really appealed to me. I was more about the, give me the serious kind of stuff. I don't, Joe, is that kind of where you are with it in terms of when you said, I don't really, I'm not a big DC fan. Yeah. I mean, that's a big part of it. And I'm not a big fan of the, the heroes. I mean, like Superman is the least suspenseful story you could possibly have. He's like this invulnerable dude and it kind of falls flat. And I don't particularly care for the like the mood of DC comics, there's, they feel more brooding and Marvel feels more, more fun. And that actually kind of translates into the movies. And I think that's why the Marvel movies are doing so much better than the DC ones. I prefer yeah. Doc and brooding myself, but yeah, that's just especially me. tonight. Yeah. Well, I'm the Batman, but anyway. <laughs> All right. Let's see if we can get to the rest of the show here. Yay! Um, yeah. <laughs> The uh, going back to the book, um, he re he mentions that you know his father gave him the name uh, Wade so that the you know as an alliterative name. Um, I threw a couple on here like Peter Parker, Clark Kent, Wally West. I'm really surprised um, they never he didn't say Bruce Wayne, like he didn't mention Batman in that. Like that would be the one that you would think would jump out at you. He mentions Clark Kent, but he doesn't mention Batman in this. Well, some... yeah, because the reference really is he's mentioned the alliterative name, so like. You know, Peter Parker, yeah. Clark Kent, yeah, right? Bruce Wayne doesn't work, but um, but Bruce Banner does. Reed Richards, Susan Storm. There's yeah, tons there's of them. A lot, well, I guess that's true. At the end of the day, you could go through a whole myriad of names, you know. Yeah. So I guess maybe that's what he was thinking. Just go with those. Yeah. And he gives us some background on his mother, uh, Loretta, who raised him on his, um, you know, raised him on her own. That she worked in the as a she had an Oasis job, or she actually had two jobs. Um, one was a telemarketer. And the other was an escort for an online brothel. Um, and he goes on to talk about how the Oasis became his virtual babysitter. Um, she'd throw a pair of headphones and a visor and just kind of let him hang out in the Oasis all day long. Um, and that he was kind of raised on these educational programs. He mentions um, Sesame Street, um, which we'll talk about very briefly here. But um, and when, I, when I read this part of it, you know, if you're a parent and you've got to get your kid to just be quiet for just a few minutes... I think we've all done it where we just turn the TV on. We put something we know is going to keep them, uh, you know, keep their attention for 10, 15 minutes. And you just plop them down and say, okay, 
watch this. I got to get care, take care of this, right? Your multitasking kind of thing. And in the Oasis, I can see where this would just get, you know, abused, uh, where parents would just throw this stuff on kids and say, here you go, you know, go run around and I don't have to worry about you. I can just see where that's, you know, something that parents would do. So, um, so this song about Sesame Street, it was released in 1969. Um, they're on season, I will know, hold, let me, I don't actually know what season they're on now, but I know it's season 46. That's 46 uh, is when they moved to HBO. So it used to be on PBS or public act or, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. public broadcasting system. Um, and then because of funding, they ended up moving to, to HBO. So the only question I'm going to ask for you guys, because we could do a whole show on Sesame Street. Did you have a favorite character? Mike, did you have one that Oscar, you... Oscar the Grouch, man. Come on. Yeah. You knew that was going to be the, the one I'd That's go with. perfect for you. Yes, exactly. Because <laughs> I just love Joe, how about you? Um, I caught some... Don't say you didn't watch I caught some history. reruns. I didn't really get a, a oh. lot of exposure to it. Uh, but I liked it. I liked the Cookie Monster. It's a good choice. It's a good one. That's safe. Yep. yep. Jones. Jonesy's Grover, no, right? There is actually photographic... There is Super photographic Grover. evidence of me wearing Bert and Ernie t-shirts as a as a very, very young child. Hey, Bert. Hey, Bert. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> um oh man, I didn't even think this one. I should have put an answer in here. Um man, you know, I did like Oscar the Grouch. But I, that wasn't yeah, but for different reasons. Oscar I didn't had relate such to Oscar good, the Grouch like you did, Mike. Oscar had such a good perspective of the world. And he taught me back then that I was gonna be a very pessimistic man. Because the world is just so, you know. But anyway, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, I don't know why Oscar he just appeared. Cool. You know why? I think it's because he was so not so bright and sunny and everyone else was all kind of cheery and everything. And he yeah. was like, you know, listen, there's real problems in the world. And that's why I'm like this. But uh, everyone else is talking to invisible elephants and, you know, giant bird. And he's kind of hey, just. He came out. He came out yeah. eventually. Yeah, Mr. eventually. Yeah, but it was a big secret. And then, you know, people got mad. Well, you know, blah, blah, blah. So we got to make it this way. And. You know, I don't even think Cookie Monster was called Cookie Monster for a while. But guy I like I, Cookie Monster's a good one too. And uh, oh, I'm going to go and, with Mr. Hooper. Sorry, I just thought about that right no, now. There you, you guys go. remember Mr. Well, what, Hooper? What, what about the uh yip, 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 those guys? I like those yippy guys. They, what, what, I don't know what their name was. The aliens there. What were the names? I think they were on the Muppet show. No, they were on the Sesame Street. The Did yip, they come out on Sesame Street? Yeah, too? the yip 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 guys there. They were. <laughs> I'm telling you they were. <laughs> We'll, we'll have to fact check that one. I don't remember. Well, yeah, we're going to fact get, get our, uh, where's Will when we need him? Uh, we'll uh, call him up right now. We yeah, need him to, yeah, to exactly. fact check this one. Yes, exactly. I, I know I'm right. I'm going to prove it when we get on, after the show, I'm going to send you something on the Discord. Martians. and I'll be like, see? The, yeah. The, yeah. The, the, the yip, yip, yip family. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Sesame Street or Muppets? Yeah, Yip Yip Martians. See? All right. See? I, see? Yeah, you, well, I, point I guess, yeah, point I for me. That's point two from, points I've gotten all... Since we've started this. <laughs> Yay. Two points. Yep. Two points. Woohoo. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's move on. Um, okay. So for the next, I'm going to condense the next six pages because it's really, it, you really kind of, he's just explaining what what it was like um, with the Oasis at the time and the near limitless amount of knowledge that Wade was able to to gather. And he became kind of enlightened about what he called the human condition, which is a real thing. Um, is you know, it? it really, I don't yeah. know. Seeing Zuckerberg this week, I don't know if he's human. So I don't know if, if we're really human. Did you see the Star Trek thing yeah. that they did the, with the him data. with data? Yeah. Yeah. He looks just like it. I'm wondering if he really did have a cyborg clone thing going on there, but that we'll talk about that another time. That Continue. was one of the funniest things. Yes. Um, all right. So sorry about that. Um, yeah, sorry. Moment. Yeah. So the human, he talks about the human condition, which is kind of subjective honestly whether you know depending on what your religion is or if you even have religion and all this and, and there's different things there's different ways that you can kind of define what the human condition is whether you're looking at it through a philosophical lens or a psychological lens or a religious lens etc but for wade we know this is um this was really quote a kick in the teeth for him because uh, he goes on to describe that pretty much he has trust issues because everything that he ever knew was all a big lie to him whether it was santa claus the easter bunny um you know, there's no heaven, there's no God. When you die, you, you're dead and that's it. And so I remember reading this and I thought, this is Mike talking to me. Like, yep. I was <laughs> pretty much, <laughs> right. pretty much my worldview right there. Yep. <laughs> right. So yep. I was I'm like, like oh, wow. wow, this is Mike. Yep. Mike yep. from uh, the Cantina cast. Yep. That this. was pretty much, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. He's, he's gotten my head already. He's spot on, right? Yep. Pretty much. I'm like, oh yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and so so in the same section we get a, a more bleakness, a more bleakness about the future. You know, wars, <laughs> famine, yeah. uh, major energy crisis. He mentions plants and animals are dying off in record numbers. Um, general civilization is in decline. So I mean, it's no wonder that everybody is obsessed with the oasis and that they're using this to escape. You know, in any way they possibly can. And and I can't say I, honestly if if I was living in this kind of world, I don't know that I would do anything different i don't i think i'd rather just be in the oasis rather than having to deal with all this crap that's going on in the outside world um and then we learned that wade's mother was depressed all the time and she took drugs just to get away that was her way of escaping everything and then she eventually shot a bad batch of something it killed her and then sadly listening uh, this was the part that just broke my heart she dies listening to an mp3 player that wade had given her um at you know for he i, I think he said he repaired it and gave it to her yeah. for christmas the year before, um, which was, oh, just ripped my heart out. Um, and then we get Aunt Alice, who's a piece of work. Um, you know, she lets Wade stay there so long as he, you know, she gets his food vouchers, um, which he doesn't get any of. He just goes and goes about and tries to get his own food. And it was right after his mom's death that the hunt began. And for Wade, this was uh, the, the, you know, the hunt and the oasis is, really gave him a goal. It gave him a purpose because I, I would, I would imagine that, you know, given everything that was going on, if that had not happened, you would have to think that Wade would probably eventually take his own life just because of how, you know, the circumstances of, of events. Um, so in the midst of all this bleakness, he makes one, another pop culture reference. He mentions the sun that he likes to look up at it because it reminds him that it's a star. And it was something that from, from uh, a show called cosmos. Um, so the homework really was really just watching cosmos episodes and this was the original one hopefully you didn't watch the more recent one um but joe was this something that you did you get a chance to to watch any of these shows and uh were you able to stay awake through any of them i i saw a couple of the original ones years ago uh i didn't i didn't have a time to get to them for this uh i did watch the new one when that was on or uh i i like this stuff though the Dry sciencey shows are right up my alley. Uh, <laughs> so this was perfect well, for me. <laughs> yeah, and it doesn't get any drier than Carl Sagan, which I don't. That's whoa, not whoa, 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 whoa. I'm picking on Carl. I know whoa. I'm picking on Carl Sagan. Whoa. I actually enjoy he's him. He's great. Listen. He's super smart. He's definitely dry. Yeah, he is. Dry. But that's part of the thing. That's part of the the way he delivers what he's talking about. Billions of billions of billions. That was the part that I was just like, <sighs> I'd fall asleep. No, but. no, no. I'm a big cow. See, th- here's a fun fact for you fine kids that I was actually going to go to school to become an astronomer. So, you know, and, and it was because of a uh, good old Carl here, because I was a big fan of the uh, cosmos back in the day, the, the original. Now, Neil deGrasse Tyson there does a good job. And I liked what they did with the, you know, the way he, they go about and stuff uh, with that, but it's still not the original to me. You can't replace Carl Sagan and what he was saying. It, it was just a, it was a fun journey. And, and like Joe, well, unless he's talking about Pluto, but yeah, go on. Uh, yeah. Well, well it, to each his own, I guess. Um, but the, like, like Joe said, I like, see, I love science and history. So I'm always watching those programs. So I'm used to a monotone voice. Just kind of, I mean, Carl was a little bit, I, I if you, you talk about those kind of uh, shows, those science shows, he was kind of a, Interesting in the sense that he he gave it a little bit of a panache, even though he was boring when he was talking. He gave it a little bit of a a something where you'd get you'd get your attention and you'd pay attention, whereas other people would be just like this boring, monotone voice throughout the whole thing, and you'd kind of nod off. Um, at least with him, it was kind of entertaining and engaging. He'd do his little mannerisms with his quirky movement and stuff like that, and he was very passionate about it. I think that's what kind of drew you in, anyway. But uh, enough about the me talking about the cosmos. Go ahead. Go on. Move on to, to Jonesy, sir. Yeah, Jonesy, how about you? Uh, Cosmo no. fan? Carl no, Sagan not fan? at all. I, I, we, <laughs> we, watched, we watched Nova instead. And I know that's a little bit more on the yeah. more natural science side, but I, I, had, I had an appreciation for what they were doing for it, but it just, it was way too dry for me. It, Carl Sagan's cadence when he speaks just drives me up a wall as an adult. 
And I'm pretty sure it drove me up a wall as a kid. Billions of billions. Yeah. Sorry. I'll, I'll do stop. you perform, yeah. prefer my voice yeah. like this? You know, you could do Stephen Hawking. <laughs> well, you can't now, but oh, oh, that was Stephen Hawking. I didn't realize yeah, that was that was, that was Rhode that Island was version. Horrible. Well, you know me, my impressions are very right. horrible. I don't have like a computer rated voice around. I can't just you know. We, yeah, we anyway. watched uh, we watched more Nova because um, that was my my dad was really into Nova as well. Uh, so we were very much into space and science and those types of things. But uh, for PBS shows, we would just rather watch Nova. We just thought it was a better series. And that, I think that dated back to what, 1974 or something like that. Um, yeah. Oh, Nova. Like almost, yeah, that's it is it's, almost it's still on 900 episodes or something crazy like that. Yeah. That's billions, um, and billions and billions of billions episodes. And billions of episodes. Um, like I'm the show. pretty sure they don't record it on <laughs> yeah. a spaceship. Yeah, no. pseudo space. No, they don't. Yeah, that was. Yeah, it, it's, it's his outfit style. that did it for me. Yeah, exactly. The 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 jacket and the laser suit. Yeah, that was good stuff. Professor um, Professor wear, as I like to call it. <laughs> they uh, they did do a re release in '86. I don't know if you guys caught that. Yep. Uh, where I actually they redid have the. I have the Blu-rays there. I have the. Uh, wow, the, you really are a huge fan oh, of this. I huh? am. I was gonna be a. Oh, now you're awake. Yeah, I, I perked up a little. You know, you talk yeah. billions and billions of stars. <laughs> I get very excited. That's I should change awful, the name. That's an awful uh, to this title yeah. Uh, episode. Yeah. All uh, right, let's go on. Yes, so let's that's press enough. on. Yes. So Cosmos was in 1980. If you get a chance, check it out. Um, and like the guy said, there's a uh, more recent version uh, that came out with Neil deGrasse uh, Grass Tyson that uh, is much more up to date <laughs> <laughs> graphically and scientifically yeah. factual. So, uh, okay. So let's go back to the book real quick and then we'll jump into a couple more here. So shirtless Rick kind of busts in at this point. Um, and after Wade refuses to, to give his laptop over to his aunt because she, you know, she sees it and sees dollar signs, she's going to sell the sucker. So he immediately, you know, races the hard drive and this guy barges in makes him flinch. He hands it over. Um, and then he heads out, he gets out of there goes out the window and we get our first kind of description of the stacks. Now I've got to say that this is one of those world building story elements that seems completely plausible to me. Like as I was reading, I never thought I was like, yeah, you probably could stack, you know, trailer homes um, and, and go vertical as opposed to horizontal and save a lot of space. I don't know how safe it is. I'm not an engineer, but it seems to make sense to me. Um, but I don't, did you guys get that same impression when, when you, for me, this one stuck out and, and we see it in the movie, obviously. And, it's it made it on um, on the posters and and certainly with the trailers and all that when it was visually presented that's exactly how I had visioned it and maybe that was just credit to Klein and how he kind of described it all but um, the stack something that was uh, did you guys get that same kind of vision and can you see this being a reality at some point in you know down the road I hope not because it's pretty unsafe that's pretty terrible I'll say that I'm 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 not a engineer but even I could tell. This is no, no good. It's fine. Well, no, I grew up in a trailer <laughs> as a, you know, my first few years of life. And yeah, you do not want to stack those things. <laughs> so see, there you go, Albert, you know. All right, Joe, help me. Is this something you you do? Would you live in one of these? No. Um, not if I, not if I had a choice. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. I definitely you're, think, you're alone in this. I definitely think in the future, we're looking at going vertical with living. We're going to need more space than we have land mass for, but uh, I don't know. I mean, in, in the movie, they they stacked them. They put them in like scaffolding. They're not actually stacked on each other. Um, yeah, and I think in the book too, he yeah. does mention that there is some kind of a framework in there. Right. It seems plausible. Uh, which actually is, a, yeah. I mean, and and that's actually a good segue because it's through that piece of it that he's mentioning that um, the way everything was kind of built out with all of that, it reminded of Donkey Kong, Burger Time, um, okay. and. He, he mentions the uh, the uh, creating his first Atari twenty six hundred game, which was a, a pitfall ripoff that he called the stacks. Um, so let's um, just briefly again. This is this is going to come up later down the road. But Donkey Kong, uh, for those of you who don't know, is is was created by the master Miyamoto, who created it um, back then, and it was our first appearance of Mario. I'm not going to get into who Mario is. I mean, we could do a whole show on that. Who's Mario? Um, yeah. Oh. Sorry. Um. He's the Italian plumber that wears green. Oh, um, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it is one of the, it's one of the earliest games. So Donkey Kong was one of the earliest games that had cutscenes in it, which was kind of a unique concept. At least, you know, that was something that I remember. And 
when you'd watch people that were really good at playing, it was really cool because you get to see more of these cutscenes um, as the game uh, played out. And we'll get into this more in chapter 22 because there's, it, it gets referenced again there. Uh, the other one's Burger Time, Peter Pepper, uh, which was you're going around and creating burgers by, you know, walking over the pieces and then they drop and, you know, cascade down. And eventually the whole purpose of the game was really to create these burgers. And you were running around from enemies like Mr. Hot Dog, Mr. Pickle, and Mr. Egg. Um did, did you guys play either one of these games? Was this uh, any fond memories, anything really quickly you want to add about them? I remember Burger Time because I remember Mr. the Pickle, but I, I don't, I can't remember, like, I just remember playing Burger Time and I can't remember exactly what the hell I did, to be honest, other than making the burger, but I vaguely remember it. Donkey Kong, yes, but I never could, again, I could never really get on the machine because everyone liked playing that one. Uh, yeah. And I didn't get to play it till later on anyway. And I didn't really like it, to be honest. I thought it was kind of, eh, it didn't appeal to me. And Pitfall, I played hours of that. But yeah, that's, that's yeah. Yep. Joe, Jonesy? I like Donkey Kong quite a bit. I played that a fair amount. I never really, I don't think I even heard of it time before I read this book. This is one of the ones I had to to uh, look up. Um, and then, not to get too much into Donkey Kong, but I don't know if you guys saw the timely timely news on donkey kong this week uh oh with the, the record holder yeah, there? billy mitchell the yeah. record holder stripped of all of his titles and banned from competition did they prove that he yeah they proved that, uh that wasn't the score yeah, they proved that he had done all those attempts on main machines and not on an arcade cabinet by going frame by frame through the footage and seeing how the levels rendered in what no i hadn't heard that uh, oh man there goes i got a i got a picture of him last year at the Austin uh, Retro Game Fest. Well, rip um, it up, our, man. Yeah, man. He's got his long hair, and I've got my thumb up. He's got his thumb up. That's sad. No, it's huh. not. Cheaters never win. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I have to look. That's I why you're going to lose, gonna... Sorrento. But yeah, anyway. All right. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. Go sleep, Mike. Okay. Uh, yeah, Jonesy, I Donkey Kong, of course. Uh, was never very good at it, but enjoyed it. I, I think I played something that would resemble Burger Time later in life, but I can't, I don't remember playing it back that, that far back. And then uh, my neighbor behind me had uh, an Atari, so we played a lot of Pitfall. There was only a few games I got to play, but yeah, Pitfall was a staple. Yeah. Um, and Pitfall was one of those games that was, it wasn't one of the, I think there was a, it was an Activision game and it was, you know, not released by Atari, but it was one of the more popular games that was released, you know, as a third party. Um, I, I'd like to do something about uh, on Activision later. We won't do it now, but there's a whole cool story behind how that company started up and, in, in, you know, where, where it originated and how successful they became, um, which, you know, they were successful for a number of years. I don't know if they're still around they or not, but I know they were at least in the 90s yep. and yeah. Yeah, 2000s. And then that's right. Still Blizzard big. picked them up, but. So yeah, they're still around. Um, the other reference that was in here was the Jedi building his uh, first lightsaber. And so we're not going to channel the Cantina cast, so everybody calm down. But uh, <laughs> when I read this, this was, I don't know why, but I went immediately to the deleted scene from Return of the Jedi where we've got Luke rebuilding his lightsaber. Did anybody do that same thing or was there a different image that popped in your head? When I you have read actually that? built my own lightsaber, uh, the hilt and everything. Yeah, no, in, in the, the real world. In the real world. In the I real did. world, Jen. Yeah, I no, did. Okay. <laughs> so I actually bought the parts and machined part of it out and actually built my own lightsaber prop. So it did, yeah, it did speak to me. Did uh, did you uh, did you bring it to Mark Hamill and then he just threw it away like it was a piece oh. of garbage? Did you do that? I'm just, just wondering. Um, sorry. Sorry. Go get a beer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start keeping uh, tally marks that's for not gonna every get rid last of this Jedi pain, joke. Okay, Mark Albert? Hamill's. It will not get rid of this pain, so stop it. <laughs> right. Joe's keeping track Someone. of it, by the way. So we'll have the final score of how many digs you took at uh, Ryan Johnson. Someone needs a nap. I didn't. <laughs> yep. Uh, uh, yeah. All right. Anything else that stuck out? It's the last Jedi. All right. <laughs> <Last Jedi>. Wow. <laughs> See, I'm infecting you uh, now. Yes. Come to Jedi the dark building side. his first lightsaber. Yeah, no. Maybe it's just me. No, it's Actually, one of my it's favorite. The, the rite of yeah. passage moment, you know? And I I yeah. did I did yeah. go back to the, the the deleted scene of Luke 2 when I read that. Yeah. Very cool. Well, actually, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, just to go back to the movie real quick, one of my favorite Easter eggs is when he opens the first gate and he says uh, Padawan. I did like that. I thought that was nice. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that's a cool little reference there. All right. So going back to the book, 
Um, we get introduced to uh, sweet Mrs. Gilmore, uh, who, spoiler alert, if you haven't read the book, she dies later. I'm so sorry. <gasps> I'm so um, upset. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, we also get the uh, a quote from the almanac, and I see this posted all over the place. Um, people really <laughs> gravitate to this quote, but he says, people who live in glass houses should shut the beep up. Uh, I can't say the word, but no, you could. Uh, I can. Yeah, beep, we could. I could have beeped you. But then you I got to, but then, yeah, that's, that's a lot in the budget though. I don't, I don't think you can afford that, but we, <laughs> right. And when I upload it, I'm going to have a guilty conscience about saying that we've got clean lyrics. So I don't, I don't want to. Oh, I won't have a problem. I with quoted that at work that this week. Me. I got to be totally honest with you. I did. did and you really? It was perfectly appropriate. And people, some laughed. Others had like this moment of shock on their face, but they totally got it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. And so, so Wade goes on to describe that, um, or at least he gives us the details and explains that, you know, he has his hideout, which is really nothing more than a van that's on the bottom of a, a number of other vehicles that were moved out of out of the way about a half a mile away from the stacks um, because they needed the space. And so um, for him, he's you know, there's there's one car that kind of sits on top in the front and he has access to um, the door. He finds the key, it you know, and that becomes his hideout. Um, where he goes and, and logs into the Oasis. Um, he mentions it's super cold, um, but he's got like a little heater in there. Um, the reception's kind of crappy, but he's run a uh, an antenna all the way to the top of the stack of these vehicles. And so that gives him some pretty good um, reception so he can log into the Oasis. And then he mentions it is his only source of exercise, really, at this point anyways, is sitting there. He's got a uh, an old, um, uh, what do you call him? Like I'm a space drawing a heater. now. Stupid bike, yeah. exercise bike, yeah. So he's got an exercise bike that he's got hooked up to a bunch of batteries, and through the process of just running the sucker, you know, riding it, he's charging these batteries, and that's the power that he's using to to power his Oasis console. Um, and he makes two quick references, and again, these are pretty light, so we're not going to, you know, spend 20 minutes on them. Oh, we could. Um, he mentions that this is kind of his Batcave and his Fortress of Solitude. So for those of you who don't know, the Batcave is <laughs> Batman's... Uh, bathroom, uh, that's where he goes to the bathroom. That's where he goes to the bathroom, yes, right? That's his outhouse. Uh, first originally mentioned in 1942 in Batman number 12. Um, and then the Fortress of Solitude. I didn't, you know, I really couldn't remember. Like, for me, the Fortress of Solitude growing up was always um, the um, Christopher Reeve movies and, and that being out in the Arctic and all that. And it was pretty interesting. Again, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in it. But when I went back and looked at some of the history here, there's a lot more history than I thought there was in, in the origins of the, the Fortress of Solitude for him don't even originate with Superman. They actually originate with a character named Doc Savage, who was um, in the 30s and 40s comics. So there's a lot of history there. But um, just quickly, did these get did these uh, references stick out to you guys? Any quick thoughts? And Joe, let's start with you. Batcave is cool. I, I When I was younger, I definitely wanted to have my own Batcave. I never really dug the Fortress. Who doesn't? Fortress of Solitude. Though I think everything about Superman kind of sucks. Oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> Joe, I'm with you on that. See, we do agree. Oh, we can get into that if we want. Uh, no, but, no. Well, see, super. Okay, hold time out. So, Superman really is not about. Is he vulnerable? We know he's not vulnerable, and, and, uh, I, and Batman I think would a, disagree with you. But that's no, beside the point. So hold on. No, 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 I'm just saying. Well, I think the. I think it's a fair argument. I think it's a fair argument to say that there's there's something not appealing about Superman because you can't really do anything to him. But if you really sit down and, and buckle, if you read the comic books and really look at the storylines and some of the more creative writers, it's the other stuff that they challenge him with, the moral issues, the sometimes the intellectual issues or the that kind of thing that because you can't you can't challenge him physically. We all we all get that. But they really do a pretty good job of finding other ways to make those stories compelling, I think. Um Batman would disagree with you though. You know, What's that? Batman would disagree with you about the physical part, but you know, no. but that's the whole no. point. What Batman says, he goes deep down. I know I'm bad, but Clark is good. He wouldn't do what he does, but you know, um, Superman's boring because he's perfect. He's a God. He doesn't do anything. Even when he has his moral dilemma, he still does the right thing where Batman, that man could go loose at any time. You don't know, but he at least does the right thing at the end. But he goes about it a different way. And the reason why he's the best superhero is because he is just a regular guy just doing crazy things. And he's kind of psychotic when you think about all the things that he does. And Superman's perfect. He's not going to be beaten. You you can't, you have to be almost, to be Batman, to go up against Superman, you have to be insane and come up with some kind of a cockamamie thing, which he did. But anyway, I won't get into that whole debate. You're a big Ben Affleck fan. We know it. I like Batfleck there, but you know. No. 
That's Actually, cool. Michael Keaton is still my favorite Batman, but you know, it's an unpopular opinion, I guess. I have to agree with you um, again, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I can mention The Last Jedi is horrible. So I'm going to go ahead and step feel in better. here <laughs> on that note. Okay. Yeah. The, the, these hit me, and I'm with you, Albert. The Fortress of Solitude is synonymous with the Christopher Reeves series of, of Superman movies. Um, that's, that's exactly what I think of every time someone brings that up, but the Batcave, and it wasn't even the eighties Tim Burton Batcave. It was the sixties, um, Adam West TV series Batcave that always comes to mind. Cause we used to watch this and, and, and Joe may have, I think it may have been on Nickelodeon or TBS or something. They had all the reruns. So I just grew up sitting in front of the TV watching the the old batman tv series reruns with uh whatever they were a type of lego that would you could assemble and we'd make our own bat copters and all this other stuff but um yeah that that's the one i think of i don't necessarily think of as the 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 80 the late 80s early 90s bat cave where it was doom and gloom it was this technological hub of um of stuff you know and this you know all the the problem solving things that they did down there yeah yeah, that the um the Adam West Batman stuff. That's that's childhood memories right there. We could probably spend some time talking about those cuz that was in syndication. I wasn't to okay, I wasn't alive back then to be fair. Um but this was in syndication. The, that Batman series was in it oh, yeah, for a so long time. It was really well, cool. And then they and that. they kept re-releasing yeah. the the movie version of it too, you know. Shark Shark Rip. Oh yeah, right? absolutely. I yeah, have that movie. Every, it was like a, every year kind of thing they'd release it. All right, so this should be a fun topic. Um, he kind of mentions that he eats breakfast and he calls fruit rocks. So we're going to get to talk about cereal again. Um, and so the challenge was really for this one was to eat Fruity Pebbles and try an off-brand of Fruity Pebbles. Did anybody get a chance to do this one? I ate some Fruity Pebbles. Fruity Pebbles I is the best cereal of all time. We don't even have... We don't have to debate this. Yes, so this is absolutely I, we can the truth. It is not the truth. It's it's exactly. exactly. <laughs> again, Joe and I have spoken for it everyone... Is, it we is can move Cocoa on. Pebbles is the greatest ever. This man, I don't ben know who false. this man is. This Jonesy guy, I don't know who he is. No, I, I have on. Cocoa Pebbles in my pantry at all times. <laughs> that still means you're wrong. I grew up wrong. on Fruity Pebbles, so I don't just, I like Fruity Pebbles a lot. But as soon yes, as I tried they're, Cocoa, they're the best. Uh, I wasn't going back. No, no, no. You you have to come back to the Fruity no, side. No, it's the milk. <laughs> it's the milk that gets me, man. It, I, that strawberry, the the best yeah, part yeah, of that strawberry type done. of flavor. No, I love that weird fruity milk at the end. Yeah. It's the milk. best. Yeah. No, exactly. I would rather, it's the best. Joe. I'd rather have strawberry Joe is right. to go with it rather than drink that milk. But yeah, no. it's that you get actually like a real chocolate milk with cocoa pebbles. No, it's it's, it's you're wrong. <sighs> All right. Well, let's let's <laughs> we're gonna end we're gonna end some we'll friendships defer, here pretty yeah. soon. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. This is gonna come to fisticuffs here. Paces at dawn, um, or dusk. The uh, in nineteen so fruity pebbles nineteen. What did we say? Seventy two. Sure, that, that works. That works. Seventy one. Nineteen seventy one. Fruity pebbles. Um, and it was created the same year as cocoa pebbles. Um, so so for those of you that don't know, fruity pebbles is you know you got the, the it's uh it's basically a rice cereal and. To be fair, we talked about this before coming on the show. This is made by Post. And if you listen to what was the first episode, yep, yep. Yeah, clearly Mr. Post, you know, redeemed himself when he created Fruity Pebbles and got off that great nuts crap kick. Um, so this is a good cereal. I'd agree. It's it's you know, probably one of my favorites. I think I mentioned it or called it out when we talked about the cereals as one of my favorites. Um and I was gonna, I, there, I was gonna bring up that Hulk Hogan. Did you guys hear about this uh, Hulk Hogan suing the uh, Post for a commercial that ran in 2010? No, no. So in the spring of 2010, there's a commercial where like Barney and Fred they're facing off against this like wrestler, and they called the wrestler Hulk Boulder, right? And then the commercial ended with um this this wrestler Hulk Boulder getting smashed in the pieces after losing the match. Well. Hulk Hogan saw this, and if you look at the character, maybe I'll put a I'll put a picture out there. But if you look at the character, he got ticked off because he felt like this was definitely him. One Hulk Hogan, Hulk Boulder. I don't know, maybe, but uh, the the character lo- is 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 kind of looked like him. So he sued Post, um, saying that they stole his image to promote the the serial and didn't ask for his permission in in doing all of that. So 
Um, I thought it was a really interesting lawsuit. I think they eventually did settle um, on this thing um, with the condition that this this commercial did wouldn't air again. If you go out to YouTube, you can find the commercial. It's still out there. Um, I like Hulk Hogan, but man, come on. He's, I think he was being kind of a jerk face here. I don't know. I don't the, see why the Flintstones whole marketing campaign and TV show is based on spoofing stuff. So yeah, it's, but that's likeness is money these days, right? Yep. Um, and then we get a real, another quick reference here about, you know, he mentions that he keeps his cons, his, uh, Oasis console in a, in a Star Trek lunchbox. <gasps> that name, Star Trek, Ugh. Star Trek. Oh, um, oh my heart. It, it, lunchboxes were huge. Like growing up in, in it definitely in the, even the late, well, so 60s and 70s for sure, um, and even through the 80s, having a metal, metallic lunchbox. And I think by 80s, we were getting into plastic ones. To I be hated honest, those at that plastic point. ones. After like Return of the Jedi, it started getting into the plastic. Definitely plastic for stuff. me. Yeah, well, what, I'm, su- I'm surprised. <laughs> it's only been plastic I'm surprised the whole even, time. I never had a metal lunchbox. No, did they, <laughs> did they have like a full-on kitchen when you were a kid? You know, like, like the whole kit and caboodle, you didn't even have to bring a lunch, right? You would just... You just get the, you know, the Domino's gets delivered or something. I don't know. I mean, no, anyway. yeah, I could buy lunch at school, but no, I did bring lunch a lot. Oh, all right. I didn't know how. It all right. So did you guys, yeah. what's, what's that? No, no, I didn't know how that worked these days. But uh, actually for me, I guess, because you were going to throw it to, you know, what our favorite lunchbox was. Yeah, I, yeah. Star Wars, naturally. I had one a hand-me-down for my brother. It was Empire Strikes Back. I love that one. And then I got a Return of the Jedi one. That was probably my last one. And it was metal. And like you said, those were the main, those were awesome to have the metal lunchbox. I felt like if you had plastic, you got looked down upon. Like, oh, you couldn't get the, the, the metal one? What's wrong with you? But that it changed. <laughs> like right after Return of the Jedi, it started changing where people were getting the, the thick plastic lunchbox things and stuff like that. And I was like, and then eventually I get into that. And then I was like, nah, I'll just brown bag it. And it worked out that way. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and the, the lunchboxes were metal, but the the little thermos or the yeah, little was whatever plastic. inside was plastic. Yeah. yeah, it always smelled weird. Mine did. I don't know why. <laughs> wow. Well, um, hey, I don't yeah. know, Jonesy. Yeah. So I was school age in the mid, like towards the mid eighties. Uh, I was born in the late seventies, so they were already transitioning. But yeah, I had an Empire Strikes Back lunchbox. I had a He Man lunchbox, so Mike and I can be friends again. Oh yes. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I had a great He Man uh, lunchbox Albert. that was metal. And, and and that was awesome. I'm pretty sure I had another one. I think I had a plastic one, but I, for the life of me, I cannot remember what it was. Oh, that's two He-Man references. And I know. That's, We're best friends again. I we'll know. have to keep that going. I How know. about Joe? Do you, get, do, you have, what, do you have a favorite lunchbox growing up? The only one that really stands out for me was the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles one that I had. So from like just a couple of years ago? <laughs> no. Wow. No, I'm kidding. So you, Wow. <laughs> wow. You're Look at Grandpa with his funny yeah, joke. I, know. I am uh, talking, uh-huh. it would have been uh, mid 90s for me, probably for school yeah. age. Yeah. So this was, uh, so based on the movies or based on the cartoon? Cartoon. Okay. So you didn't have Vanilla Ice and Secret of the Ooze? No, but I wish ninja I rap. had. I do like that ninja rap. Think. That's a good rap. That's a good rap. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with you. Anything Vanilla Ice does is good. All right. Um, wow, I didn't get a no comment from the peanut gallery on that one. Um, all right, so let's, let's talk about our last topic and wow, we are way over on time. So you think, um, good luck editing this (laughs) one. Um, so he fires up his Oasis console. Um, he initiates the, the login phrase. You have been recruited by the star league to defend the frontier against Zor and the Kodan Armada. So this is a blatant reference to a movie called the last starfighter. Uh, the Last Starfighter was released in 1984, uh, directed by Nick Castle, written by Jonathan Butill. Um, it stars Lance Guest as Alex Rogan. Um, we've got Catherine uh, Mary Stewart as Maggie Gordon, Norman Snow as Zur, and then Robert Preston as Centauri. Uh, and I skipped over Greg. Greg is uh, Dan O'Hare. I can't ever say his name. He's got like an Irish name, O'Hare Lee. Um, yeah, Robert Preston played Centauri, and this was the final movie that Robert Preston was in. Uh, he died of lung cancer just a few le- years after this movie came out. And just uh, so The Last Starfighter, along with Tron, is is one of the earliest movies really that's ever done computer graphics um, in the movies. Uh, Tron kind of went for this. Um, everything is supposed to look like computer graphics type of approach. 
And the last Starfighter went with this, let's try to do computer graphics that make it photorealistic. So depending on, you know, how you look at it, you could argue that they're both, they were both, um, you know, the, the first in, in their, I don't know, I don't want to say genre, but in, in their approach, at least in how to incorporate computer graphics, um, done by the same company. Uh, I forget the computer, the company's name, uh, now, but the same company that did the graphics for Tron did it for, um, the last Starfighter. Uh, they had a $15 million budget and it made 28 million. So it was a profitable movie when it came out. Um, and the premise of the movie is pretty simple. You've got a guy named Alex Rogan. He lives in a trailer park uh, with his little brother and his mom. He's got a video game, one video game there called Starfighter. He plays that game. And what he doesn't know is that this is a recruiting mechanism for uh, a real space kind of uh, war that's kind of going on. Um, and when he gets the record breaker, breaks the score, the highest score or whatever, um, that kind of sends a signal to this character named Centauri who comes down and decides that he wants to recruit him to come and, um, you know, defend and fight against uh, Zor and that, that whole Kodan armada. So um, that's kind of the, 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 the premise of the story. Um, let me start with um, Joe on this one because I'm, I'm curious. This movie, you know, is pretty dated, obviously. And when you go back and look at it, even when, when I've, I mean, I've seen the movie a billion times at least. It's one of my favorites. I feel bad for you that, that you've seen it that many times. <laughs> billions and billions of <laughs> exactly. times. Exactly. I feel bad um, that you wasted those billions and billions <laughs> of hours on this boring movie. It's a great movie. But Joe, did you... No, did you, uh, there's nothing what great you, about it. What was your take on this movie as you saw it? I've seen this a bunch of times. I love this movie. <laughs> yeah, see? Thank you. Um, they should have done a lot less CGI. It's not pretty. Uh, and some of the practical stuff is actually pretty good in this movie. Uh, but there's something to say about that storyline of like anybody can be a hero. Something oh, from yeah. nothing. Oh, that sounds like The Last Jedi. I that knew that Brian was coming. Johnson I was hope. setting yeah. you up for yeah. that, Mike. Yeah, thank you. Thank mm-hmm. you. That was like a T right on the T. Boom. <laughs> yeah. Um, Last Starfire did it better, I guess. I don't know. Uh, yeah, well, that's not saying much. But. No, I really like this movie. I like Centauri a lot. Uh, I like how he puts his face on oh, with yes, his my napkin. Boy. Yeah, yeah. This the storyline. So just really quickly on that, to, that is one of the things that it just seems like it's a. I don't know, and, and Mike's going to kill me for this, one, but it, it seems like it's one of those feel good kind of storylines, and there are cheesy moments in it, but it doesn't really get in the way. I never thought it really got in the way of of kind of like the plot and what it was trying to do. And there are some parallels here, I think with, I mean, you've got Wade in ready player one, who is, um, you know, obviously obsessed with video games. There's obviously that direct parallel, but then, you know, Alex in this movie lives in a trailer park and he, he kind of says he's, he's, he doesn't want to be there. He doesn't want to be in this trailer park. He doesn't want to be in the small town. He doesn't want to go to community college. He wants to do something more with his life. And there's, you know, that one scene where that probably goes on too long where he's kind of staring up at the mobile and, looking at the stars and stuff, but you get the idea that this guy really wants to go on and he's destined to do something more and he wants to do something more with his life. Um, He's just not sure how to get there, but there's, there's a lot of parallels I think with ready player one. Um, But Jonesy, um, is this a, is this a thumbs up or thumbs down for you? Um, Let me, let me, let me tell you a movie that parallels was star Wars episode four, which was like a hundred million times better. And, I remember watching this as a kid and I was like, why would I watch this when I could just go watch Star Wars? You know, I can remember Thank Star you. Wars better than like how this movie <laughs> played out for me. So I liked Centauri. Uh, you the, know, the, the, like the napkin on the face was iconic. That was a great scene. I, I remembered that vividly as a kid. It was interesting that Will Wheaton yeah. was in this movie to tie it back to the audio book. Um, yep. He was Lewis's friend. You can just see him for a second. Um, but no, I just continually remember it. I was like, this is a blatant ripoff of everything that Star Wars did well, except we are going to do it like horribly bad. I mean, the the sets and every, I mean, they were over. God, I can't, I can't, I, I could do a laundry list of things I did not like about this movie. The only thing I can appreciate was that it was only about an hour and 40 minutes. It did keep moving. It didn't get super boring or anything like that. But man, I just, I just kept telling myself as a kid and as of right now, like I would just rather go watch star Wars and spend the two plus hours watching that. I don't know why I'd keep coming back to this movie. Wow. All right, Mike, I agree with Jonesy. 
<laughs> Plus, you get the lightsabers. So there's that. So the, yeah, I, I'm not gonna bad mouth the movie, and I'll, I'll just leave it at the that. Yeah, but there's rough. no beta unit. There's no beta unit <laughs> in Star Wars. Yeah, that's comedy gold right there. Yeah. The beta unit. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not. And it's funny because it's not, when but, when they uh, so just real quickly some some trivia about it when they filmed the movie and they they screened it for the first time. The audience reception was so positive with um, the beta unit that they actually went back and reshot those um, some they had shot reshot some additional scenes. So when you watch the movie, if you ever notice Alex's hair as the beta unit, it always looks a little odd. It's because he had already moved on. It put, you know they were already in, in post production. He had another role. He had already cut his hair, and so that's a wig that's on him. So if you ever see it and it looks a little jarring, it's because they had to throw a wig on there. Because they went back and reshot all this additional footage of these these hmm. you know comedy moments with the I, I did notice that. Think, so. Yeah, that's interesting to know. Yeah. Um, the the other thing. So for me, this this is again. So this is a movie that yes, I had Star Wars and I can watch Star Wars, but I never really I, maybe no, I shouldn't say that. I drew the comparisons, but they were more positive comparisons for me. It was more like I got Star Wars and I can get this as well. But the real the real tie in for me was the video games, because this is something that was, um, you know, you got video games, you've got Star Wars, I guess, or you've got a Star Wars type setting in space, that kind of thing. So you were kind of getting the both best of both worlds here um, is what they were trying to do. Uh, I thought the score was really good. Um, and I I'm sorry, I forget the the, the composer who did it. But um, I thought that was a really good I thought they did a good job that if you listen to the theme song. It's catchy enough, um, and so I've still got it in my head right now because I was watching it a couple days ago. But um, that stood out, and the idea that uh, there was one thing that I and so this is a movie I did see in the theaters um, when it came out, and I very vividly remember watching the credits scroll because we we always had to sit there and watch the credits. If if Dad was going to pay two dollars to go to a movie, we were sitting until those lights came on. But when the credits were rolling at the very end, there is a message that says. Um, from that says that you can play this game. Uh, it's coming from Atari. Um, it is video game available from Atari Inc. And so, I, you know, I remember that and thinking, holy bananas, we're going to be able to play this game on the Atari 2600. Well, the game never came out. Um, so this was right after, so they, they promoted that the game would come out at a, a version of the last Starfighter. And it was right around the time that the crash was happening. And so, Atari had, uh, they were, you know, leaking money left and right. They were kind of in a financial crisis and they were on the brink of collapsing that the, to actually produce this game, I think I've heard is, is up to, it was up to like $10,000 to manufacture or get it all done. They didn't want to spend the cash on it. So there were a couple of prototypes that were actually created for the game. Um, it was never officially released as the last Starfighter, but what we had was the Atari 2600 and the 5200 versions um, the 2600 was released as a game called Solaris. So if you ever see that game that they did some mo minor modifications here and there, but the game Solaris was really the game that was originally supposed to be, um, the last Starfighter for the 2600. And then for the 5200 and the Atari home systems, that was a game called Star Raiders two, which is a really cool game. And if you ever see that, if you go, um, just go YouTube Star Raiders two, and you look at the video footage, you can see where they were trying to model uh, a lot of what we saw in terms of graphics on the uh, the movie, The Last Starfighter, um, uh, there as well. There was an NES version that came out later on, uh, which was just a port of a Commodore 64. And then in, I, I I was so giddy, I couldn't find it. I used to have it on my old computer, but in 2007, they did a homebrew version. So a bunch of you know developers got together and they actually recreated the Starfighter game that Alex plays in the movie. And it was a freeware. You could just go download it, install it, and you could play that game. Um, I don't. I re remember playing it I, at the time. I think I was into other games. I didn't play it too much. I couldn't tell you if I don't remember the gameplay being all that great. No, I don't know if that's fair or not. That's just my memory or my recollection of it. Um, but so there was a again. I get all that to say that there were a number of video game uh, stuff that was supposed to come out that just never never came came to be. Um, I'm gonna guess none of you played the, played any of those games, or 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 is that true? Or did you guys ever get a chance to to look into this stuff? I remember seeing the last nope. Starfighter in, on the Atari cartridge, but I never actually played it. Mike, nope. Somebody wake up, Mike. No, I said no. 
Oh, I said no. You just got to pay attention, sir. You're the one yeah, falling asleep uh, at the wheel, not me. It uh-huh. is. It's it's getting late. A little bit. Yeah. So, um, I guess the only thing I'll say, was, the last thing, and and maybe turn it over to you guys for any final comments on the last Starfighter. It's you know, graphically what they were doing at that time, and it's kind of like the same argument we made with asteroids, uh, or not sorry, asteroids. It's space invaders. It was this was this was the first. This is where it all started. Everything that we know in terms of mixing computer graphics, CG with real time movies, this is this is where it started. This is the, the the origin of it all. And, you know, it was a very, very um uh I wouldn't say lucrative, but it was certainly a project that going into it, they knew they weren't sure if they would be able to pull it off. And they had models on set at one point because they were they only had so many months to produce this and they were taking a chance. They're rolling dice here that they were gonna be able to to put a movie together with computer graphics and kind of seam those together. And, and, you know, it's not, it's jarring. If you look at it now, you can definitely see where, you know, there's moments where it's kind of like, whoa, that really looks CG. And then there's other moments that are all, they're fine, but everything in there, that's not a practical effect is computer graphics. And and again, it is the, the kind of like one of the grandfathers of it all. So for that, I think it holds it, it, it holds up well. And I think it's certainly got a place in, in science fiction cinema. So, so they can, um, so, Mike, any other, any final thoughts there on the last Starfighter? None. The composer for you, yeah, the composer for you was uh, Craig. I can never pronounce his last name, Safan or Safan. And what's interesting about yeah. him is he actually he composed, yeah, Didn't he composed he a Cheers? lot of the music on Cheers and won a number of awards. Yeah. Yes. Bam! I knew that, and I was going to mention it earlier, but I was, when you said Cheers, and I thought, no, nah, I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm. Yeah. So yeah, he yeah, that's that's great. He did uh and I think he did a lot of TV. I don't know that he did a yeah, whole he lot. He did of a TV. lot of television. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that he did the track. theme song, but he did a lot of the other music throughout the episodes and it was very very successful. Right. Joe, we on a good note with you. Any final comments on the last Starfighter? It was super ambitious. It was really trying to do something. Uh and it did it so it wasn't like didn't bet it out of the park, but it did a great job of being what it was and it's super fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I that's a good way to put it. Um, the logo was cool. We didn't talk about the Death Blossom. That was like the, you know, you watch the movie and then that when that scene was always the the scene that stood out for me was the Death Blossom and that thing spinning around and you know you know cheering them on. And then and then finally the last thing and I'll end it on, I'll end at least this part of it with this, the one line out of the whole movie that it just stuck with me for years and and a number of people that I've always run into we. You say it and people know it, but it's that very last line when they're about to go down with the ship and he says, what do we do now? And he says, we die. And then you get that little flip of the, the little lens visor thing on it, um, which, by the way, is the name of the I called this the the name of this episode. We die. So that's the reference. It's the reference to um, the last Starfighter. So um, that's kind of how the this chapter one ends. Um you know, we should also mention that, you know, once he logs in, you know, we get the welcome to the Oasis, uh, Parzival and Parzival's, I think this is the first reference that we get from, uh, for his name that he uses in, in chapter, uh, in the next episode, I think we'll actually get into some of the origins there. Um, and then it finally, the whole chapter ends with the now, uh, infamous three words, ready player one. So there we go. We did it. We got through the whole episode. Um, Mike, any final thoughts? words any final thoughts on this this chapter um not really it's again it, I, it's like an extension of the prelude so it's kind of just establishing more things and kind of getting wet in the whistle of what is to come so uh it was pretty good pretty good start uh for the book yeah, yeah it was a lot of great Jonesy? world building and uh man it was jam-packed with references so it it it, it, it was it, it was a lot of replayability to go and try to catch them all but yeah no i thought it was really a fantastic amount of world building to really set the stage for what we're getting into. Cool. Joe, any final thoughts for you? The perfect first chapter for me. I am a sucker for dystopic stuff and it's really super dystopic. So I was hooked right away. Yeah. Yeah. They, like I said, I, we, I mean, honestly, I skipped over so much of the chapter and then again, uh, I started this with at the beginning of the show. It is one of the longer chapters. So this is probably going to be one of the longer episodes. I could have easily broken this up into two episodes. That would have um, been nice, but what, yeah, what's great about hey. what's, what's great. <laughs> hey, but I don't edit. So yeah, it's yeah, I know. What's great know. about the chapters yeah, though, is yeah. that you can actually see our world going that path. So it doesn't really seem like it's all that far-fetched, you know? Yeah. 
Oh, far yeah. Far it really yeah. does hit home on a few things pretty hard. You guys are so yeah. pessimistic. Come on now. Well, oh, not yeah, on Mike's mouth. <laughs> Seriously. Come on, folks. I'm not going to end right. that well, way. With that, with that, we will end the show for today. Um, next up, we've got uh, in the next chapter, we're going to be talking Mighty Python and the Holy Grail. Uh, we've got a quick Princess Leia reference that will probably turn into a 30 minute segment, knowing us. Uh, we're going to talk World of Warcraft, even though it's not explicitly mentioned. Um, there are a lot. There's a lot of stuff there that when you read this next chapter coming up, you you know what you know what he's talking about. It's World of Warcraft. Uh, Warcraft. Make no mistake about it. And then what I'm really most excited about is we're going to get to look at the dorky girl fantasies. So 16 Candles, Pretty in Pink, Ugh. Some Kind of Wonderful, Ugh. and the dorky boy fantasies, which is The Breakfast Club, Weird Science, and probably one of my favorite movies all time, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Now so, you got me. See, now you got me hooked in. There you go. So if you're not excited for that, nothing's going to get you. So if Mike's excited, then you know we're doing something right. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> all right. So we'll end it here. Uh, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Jonesy. Thank you, Mike. And thank you guys for listening. Really appreciate it. Again, sorry about the long episode. Break this up into a couple chapters. Um, please share. Uh, if you like us, if you want to do all of that, please look at the links. We're on Facebook. Uh, we're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. Um, we've got a way to donate money to help support the cost to keep all this running. If you want to go that route, if nothing else, please leave us a good review if you can on iTunes or anywhere you're listening to your uh, podcast. Um, so take care. We'll see you guys on the next episode. The views and opinions of the basement hosts are of our own and are not in any way affiliated with Random House or Ernest Klein. All quotes, music, sounds, trademark, and copyrighted material referenced in the show are owned by the respectful companies and creators and are used by the basement as fair use for entertainment purposes only. It would take me a month to read this whole disclaimer, but sad to say, I don't have that kind of time.